Okay, so um, uh, let us start. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Park and I'm the hosting chair of 2020 uh, Smart Freight Symposium. Uh, currently working as an associate professor in La Sonde School of Engineering at York University. Uh, this is the second day uh, Smart Freight Symposium. And then we have uh, three different sessions and those sessions uh, similar to the last uh, week, uh, we are going to have uh, Q and A sessions, uh, or after uh, all speakers' speeches, uh, and then we will have a short break between the sessions. Uh, and then each session, the uh, different moderators is going to facilitate the sessions. So I'm uh, honored to introduce uh, today's uh, opening uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Luis Paul Tadip. Uh, he is the currently director uh, at Transport Canada, and he developed the concept of measuring supply chain uh, using a fluidity indicator, taking into account all modes of transportation from an end to end perspective. So, welcome, uh, Riz, for, for his uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Park. Good morning to you all. Bonjour à tous. Pleasure to be, uh, to be uh, opening this session. I myself uh, graduated from York University many, many years ago, but was a uh, different place then, I'm sure. We had a joint program in transportation and it's, it was a quite exciting time. So the first thing is that it's always great to see a workshop or seminars or involving uh, students uh, studying the, the art and science of transportation. Um, transportation is something that has sometimes gone out of fashion. And so it's always good to see that people are coming back to the basics of transportation, which is so important to our country. Um, Transport Canada is very, very pleased to be supportive of the Smart Freight Center. And the way that we do that is uh, through access uh, to some of the data that we, that we use on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Mostly the American Trucking Research Institute uh, GPS data, sort of probe data, and the uh, here traffic analytics data. So we're very pleased to have made those data sets available and uh, accessible to the Smart Freight Center data warehouse at the University of Toronto. And as we understand it, uh, agreements are being done between the three universities, uh, York, McMaster, and uh, U of T to get those data accessible for the research. As we all know, data is very, very critical in, in research. So we are very pleased to have done so. The, the one thing I've noticed from the program today is that um, just perhaps it's time that we think a little bit beyond the, the simple modal aspect. And one of the field, one of the thing that we feel strongly about Transport Canada is this multimodal aspect. So I spent 30 some years looking at trucking in different aspects but definitely each mode play a very, very critical role in our, uh, in, our, in, our, in our supply chains. So I think I would encourage all students to look carefully at that aspect uh, of our supply chain. One mode in, is not often enough to, to, to be on their own a full supply chain. Things travel with different modes. So if anything, I would enc encourage you to look at the, at the relevance and importance of other functions, other modes into the uh, transportation supply chains. So again, have a good, have a good workshop, have a good, have a good seminar and uh, looking forward to the presentations. And uh, thank you again, Peter, for inviting uh, Transport Canada to open this up and looking forward to working more with the Smart Freight Center and all of the research that you are doing. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rhys Ford, uh, for your opening remarks, appreciate it. 
before I introduce the first session moderator, uh, I'd like to say that uh, this is a virtual environment. So unfortunately, I'm having some sort of uh, logistical challenges giving you, uh, you know, homemade uh, copies, but uh, uh, please enjoy yourself at your home. That is one thing that I want to say. Uh, another thing is that um, 10 minute time window is uh, uh, very short. So what we are going to do is that please look at your uh, chat box and then, uh, you know, one of us is going to let you know how, much, how many minutes remaining for uh, during your uh, speeches, okay? Uh, for the first session, I'm going to introduce the moderator, uh, Dr. Mary uh, Durinja, is an assistant professor at the Song School of Engineering at Hyora York University. And then uh, he has obtained his PhD degree from the University of Toronto, and his area of research is uh, uh, optimal planning and control of transportation systems in smart cities uh, using autonomous vehicles. So welcome, Dr. Mary uh, Durinja, uh, for your uh, session presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the great introduction. And thank you, Louis Paul, for your opening remarks and emphasizing the importance of multimodal transportation. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to having a nice uh, symposium. So our first session today is going to be on related to the last mile logistics. Um, this is the movement of goods from distribution centers to final destinations, which in most cases is uh, customer residences or homes. And the goal of this last mile is to make deliveries as quickly as possible at, and at minimum cost. Uh, this final leg of the supply chain makes a drastic 20 per, 28 to 30% of the total cost of delivery. So it's really important for us to try to alleviate this load of the last mile. So today's uh, talks are going to be related to e-commerce in last mile logistics, uh, intelligent truck utilization, impacts of signal priority systems for trucks, and uh, the location of mobile, lock uh, mobile locker uh, storages and uh, allocations. So our first speaker is um, Haider al Mashala. Haider uh, finished his Master's of Science in Industrial Systems Engineering and will be starting a PhD in Computational Science and Engineering at McMaster University. And uh, his primary research looks at the supply chain and uh, supply chain big data optimization and e-commerce in the last mile of delivery. And so with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Haider. Okay, just want to make sure if Hader is getting his presentation right and ready to go. Hello? Uh, perhaps you can rotate to the next person and then we can later on invite her. Invite okay, him. sure, no problem. Okay, so we'll move on to our second speaker for now. Our se second speaker is our very own Soha Saeed who will be talking about uh, intelligent uh, truck utilization. Soha is our second year um, civil engineering master's student at York University working with uh, Dr. Kevin Gingrich. And, um, and um, sorry, let's just see if Hader is back. Okay, so nothing from Hader hits. Okay, so Soha is our very own graduate student working with Dr. Uh, Peter Park, and uh, he, she's going to be telling us about um, the impact of uh, truck intelligent truck utilization. So with that, I'll pass it on to Soha. Yeah, hello, uh, I'll just take two minutes. It's okay, take your time. So. Uh, because we are sort of pushing you forward a little bit, I think it's uh, perfectly fine for you to take your time on this and prepare yourself. We'll wait a few minutes. And um, Okay. Thank uh, you, Soha. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Soha Sayed, and I'm working on intelligent lane utilization to improve freight transportation mobility under the supervision of Dr. Peter Park. 
So we are focusing on freight transportation because freight transportation plays an important role in economic development of any region because every sector of economy relies on freight for moving its good from one place to another, be it a pickup van which delivers a parcels to residential area from the local businesses or a heavy truck that uh, transfer goods from one city to another. Normally, the delivery system to the residential, uh, residential area is known as the last mile delivery in Ontario. So uh, we would just like to conclude that everything that we use on daily basis, like food or uh, clothes, has made some part of its journey in a truck. That's why we are focusing on freight transportation. The objective of this study was to examine and justify the need and feasibility of implementing ILU technique and to improve the mobility of selected corridor by implementing ILU techniques and examine the effect due to them in terms of travel time saving. The methodology that we followed for uh, this research was to review literatures from North American and international jurisdiction uh, who have already applied ILU techniques or are planning to apply ILU technique. Then further on to uh, develop a micro level simulation model using WISM software and a macro level simulation model using ME software. So we uh, developed it in a way that first we ran a macro, micro, simulation, um, micro simulation model than a macro simulation model and again uh, back to micro simulation model and evaluation uh, and to evaluate the performance in terms of travel time saving and losses and then to make any recommendation whichever is better for the uh, study corridors. So from uh, operationally separated and physically separated truck lanes, we opted from for uh, operationally separated truck lane. And from the options of operationally separated truck lanes, we opted for truck lane restriction and truck only lane for this study. Talking about the study area, our first study corridor was Derry Road. Derry Road is also known as Regional Road 5. Uh, it is 9.22 kilometer long and has 16 signalized and three unsignalized intersection. And there are three lanes in each direction. Our second study corridor was Highway 50. Highway 50 is 11.02 uh, kilometer long. And uh, there are 11 signalized and three unsignalized intersection. From Mayfield till Sears Warehouse, there are two lanes in each direction and rest of the corridor is having three lanes in each direction. So for micro simulation analysis, we were provided with the uh, turning movement data. So the turning movement data was in the form of a synchro file and we were provided with the signal traffic signal data as well. So we have used ring barrier control system for both the study corridor. Uh, the data was uh, provided for 20, uh, 2016 and for PM peak hour and midday hour. Uh, the model was calibrated well to reflect the real world situation using GEH statistics. So this is a snapshot from the WISM software. It is showing uh, intersection of Langstaff and Derry Road. So the result uh, was obtained for micro simulation and it uh, showed that for Derry Road, truck lane restriction will be the best option if we consider all vehicle and truck. But if our focus was only for the truck, then uh, innermost lane as a truck only lane showed the best option. The improvement over here was around two minutes. For Highway 50, truck lane restriction showed the best result for both for uh, all vehicles and for the trucks. Again, here, uh, the improvement was one to two minutes. This is a result for the PM uh, sim micro simulation. For the midday data, we observed that Derry Road had the same pattern, uh, as in truck lane restriction showed the best result. But for Highway 50, there was no uh, improvement found in terms of travel time saving. 
After performing the first uh, stage of micro simulation, we moved on to macro simulation. So macro simulation was performed using ME software and we were provided with passenger vehicle and commercial vehicle model, uh, but the data was only available for PM peak hour. So as I mentioned earlier, the data for VISIM was for the year of 2016, but uh, the data that we received for EMI was uh, for base year 2011 and forecasted year 2031. And uh, that's, uh, that's why we developed matrices for uh, 2016 using linear interpolation. So we checked these results with the growth factor method as well. And the difference was negligible. So we, we moved further with linear interpolation method. Uh, then changes were made in the network uh, for uh, in the ME network for 2016, if there was any. And we, uh, th we used it as a, a base scenario to develop truck only lane scenario in ME software. So once uh, the truck lane scenario was developed in ME software, we ran a multi-class traffic assignment to obtain the result. And that result was used for the second stage of uh, micro simulation. So the changes were in terms of uh, traffic volume. So we inputted those results into the WISM software and ran the simulation again. The result showed that for dairy road, outermost lane as truck only lane will be the best option with around three minutes of travel time improvement for truck. And for highway 50, uh, truck lane restriction will be the best option. So these are the charts for truck and for both the corridors, we observed around three minutes of travel time saving. I would like to thank Region of Peel for providing us with the data and my supervising committee, Dr. Peter Park and Dr. Kevin Gingrich. Thank you. Thank you, Soha, for the wonderful presentation. We'll just wait a, a few seconds to see if there are any questions that will be uh, forwarded to us. Um, we have a separate uh, Q&A sessions uh, at the end of all uh, speaker speeches in, in the first session. So you can uh, introduce our next speaker. Okay, uh, all right. So our next speaker is gonna be uh, Ravi. So uh, Ravi is uh, a uh, graduate student at uh, York University as well. And um, he is uh, uh, going, He's completed his bachelor's degree in civil engineering and is working as and is now working as a transportation designer at Lee Consulting. And Ravi has more than four years of experience as an assistant manager in highway construction and planning. And I'll pass it on to him, who will be talking to us about um, other aspects of uh, last mile logistics. Go ahead, Ravi. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ravi Chandra, master student uh, working under Dr. Peter Park and Dr. Kevin. Today, I'll be presenting on truck signal priority uh, for, uh, sorry. Today, I'll be presenting on the truck signal priority for uh, the major arterial roads in the region of Peel. Uh, I would like to thank region of Peel uh, for organizing this event and also providing me with the data for this research. Uh, uh, starting with the rationale for the truck signal priority, if you look at the video, as soon as the signal turns green, the truck accelerates and tries to cross the intersection. By the time the truck crosses the stop bar, almost four, uh, four uh, passenger cars have already crossed the intersection. This is mainly due to the, uh, their size and truck experience a drag when accelerating. At signalized intersection, this causes a startup delay for trucks and other vehicles that are following the, uh, following the trucks. Another typical condition in region of Peel along the major truck routes uh, is that we have trucks on all the lanes at, uh, at the intersection. As explained earlier, the slow acceleration causes additional delay to the cars following, causing congestion and delay in the queue. Now imagine the situation of the driver who is stuck in this uh, long queues behind all these uh, trucks especially during the peak hour, where it almost takes more than a half hour just to cross the intersection. 
to summarize uh, trucks due to their slow dynamics and large size have a determined uh, influence on the traffic movement stop truck increases congestion at signalized intersection due to low acceleration rate even with the uh, increased congestion economic and environmental cost we can, we won't be able to restrict the trucks from roads since every day almost 1.8 billion dollars worth of goods are moved through the region of peel by approximately 68000 trucks Thus, uh, for our uh, research, the objectives uh, included assessing the impact of the current signal timings on the truck traffic along the Dixie Road corridor in the Peel region, develop and analyze the traffic signal strategies to reduce the frequency of the stop, truck, uh, stop trucks, reduce overall traffic for trucks and passenger cars at signalized intersection. The research study area includes a five kilometer corridor along the Dixie Road uh, between Highway 401 and Highway 407 in the region of Peel. This corridor involves eight signalized intersections and three non-signalized intersections. It is one of the major truck routes and has highest average uh, hourly traffic volume of uh, almost 2,600 vehicles and a heavy vehicle penetration rate of almost 31% during the PM peak. This table shows the number of trucks uh, along the Dixie Road corridor. The northbound and southbound shows the Dixie Road corridor. The other thing to note here is the Dixie Road and the Derry Road intersection where the Derry Road becomes the major road and Dixie Road becomes the minor road. I'll be talking about this in the scenarios, so I just wanted to mention it here. In terms of the data required for the uh, research, we got our data from the synchro analysis which was done uh, in the region of Peel. We used the turning movement data provided by the region of Peel synchro analysis. Coming to the signal strategy, the signal priority was used to reduce the frequency of the stop trucks. Signal priority, as the name suggests and also defined by the DOT, is simply the idea of providing special treatment to transit vehicles or specific type of vehicles, in this case for the trucks. The signal priority can further be classified into active signal priority and passive signal priority. Active signal priority is based on the real-time detection of the vehicle. Uh, this active signal priority can further be classified into isolated and integrated. The isolated uh, signal priority, the signal modification is based on the detection of the vehicle and signal timing uh, adjustment at the intersection. However, the integrated signal prioritization considers signal timing adjustment as one of the several factors that need to be <coughs> adjusted. So uh, in, uh, the different strategies which are used for the active signal priorities uh, include the green time extensions in which uh, the, gre uh, the green phase is extended for an additional time so that the uh, detected vehicle can cause the intersection. Similarly, red turnication where the green, uh, the green phase start early uh, as soon as the, uh, the truck or any other uh, transit or specified vehicle is detected along the intersection so that it can cross the intersection early. The third is the third uh, strategy being the green reallocation, where there is a uh, where the green phase is shifted based on the vehicle detection. There are many other different strategies which involve the phase insertion, phase rotation, and actuated signal priority phase. But for this research, we will be using the green time extension only for the truck signal priority. Similar to transit signal priority. The uh, truck signal priority involves four major steps. That is the first, the detection of the truck along <clears throat> at the check-in detectors. These check-in detectors can be of different types, uh, either loop detectors, video sensors, or even by connected vehicle technology. These check-in detectors are placed at a specified distance considering the safety uh, uh, and also considering the uh, stopping side distance at the intersection. Once the vehicle is detected uh, at the check-in detector, the request is sent to the signal coordinator, which would analyze the signal timing, uh, analyze the request and uh, modify the signal timing or even reject it based on the uh, running phase. Talking about the literature review, everyone would be very familiar with the transit signal priority. The transit signal priority is one of the most familiar and like uh, has many studies and applications already implemented. But for truck signal priority, there are comparatively unknown. So the most recent one, which was uh, done as a trial uh, for a three month trial was done in Sydney in Australia, where they used uh, uh, Bluetooth technology for the green time extension only. 
uh, and the, uh, the second recent was the one at the Detroit where they announced the world's smartest intersection where they use green time extension only and they were able to reduce the truck stops by almost 22% and fuel consumption by 20%. So these are some of the examples of the simulation uh, or studies which were done for the truck signal priority. One thing to note here is uh, when they were trying the truck signal priority for trucks, they were able to reduce the travel time for all vehicles by for all vehicles by 26%. So by uh, providing priority for the trucks, we were able to reduce the travel time for other vehicles as well. To study the impact of the truck signal priority, micro simulation analysis was used uh, for our analysis. This is just a screen recording from the micro simulation model for the LISM. Uh, oh, the, uh, this is the screenshot from the Wism network showing the eight signalized intersection with the third uh, third signalized intersection, the Dixie and Derry Road. They, uh, I wanted to mention it here again is Derry Road is the major road at this intersection. So initially we started with the PM peak uh, uh, traffic data for the analysis, but uh, we came to know that active signal priority strategies are less effective when the roadway approaches capacity. So during the PM peak, the roadway capacities were almost more than 75% because of which the active signal priority was not uh, efficient enough. So we also included the off-peak hour. The different scenarios which we considered for truck signal priority was the base scenario uh, the, representing the existing scenario for the PM peak and then truck signal priority along the PM peak. Then we had the base scenario for midday off peak and then we applied the truck signal priority for uh, midday off peak. We did a sensitivity analysis at the end uh, by increasing the truck volume and truck uh, total traffic volume. The truck signal priority was pro done in three different uh, uh, implementation. One was along providing the northbound and southbound along the Dixie Road. The second was providing along the eastbound and westbound along the minor roads. The third one was providing along the major road, which is which we called as the hybrid scenario. At this, uh, the, uh, at this intersection, the truck signal priority was provided along eastbound and westbound. So we use three different measures of effectiveness that is travel time and frequency of stop trucks, uh, intersection delays. So coming to the results, uh, sorry, uh, I'll skip to the, uh, we were able to, or, uh, initially when we applied it for northbound and southbound, we were able to, we did not find a significant result, but for the midday off peak with a uh, hybrid scenario, we were able to see a travel time reduction by almost 6%. Similarly, for the number of uh, stops, fre frequency of number of stops, we saw that the, uh, for the midday off peak with a uh, hybrid scenario, we were able to reduce the number of stops by almost 12% for cars, 10% for trucks, and almost 12% uh, for all types of vehicles. Then we further uh, did a sensitivity analysis of, of, by increasing 5% increments. With the increase in the uh, truck volume, we saw that the delay was increasing, but uh, with the increase in the travel time, the uh, here, with the increase in the volume, uh, we saw that the travel time reduction increased, but after a point it started decreasing. So just to uh, summarize, with the uh, truck signal priority was able to reduce the total travel time and the frequency of uh, stops for trucks, as well as for the passenger cars. With this, in, uh, with this decrease in the travel time and stop frequency, it is expected to reduce the congestion at signal intersection, fuel consumption, pavement wear and tear and greenhouse gas emissions and economic benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. We appreciate your great presentation on uh, traffic signal priority for trucks. Yeah. And uh, as Peter just mentioned, we'll uh, take up any questions at the end of the session. Our next speaker is a hater, uh, Mashallah, who will be talking about um, e-commerce logistics impacts on uh, communities. Uh, hater is a uh, postdoctoral fellow at uh, McMaster University's 
at McMaster University, and uh, he holds a Master of Science in Industrial Systems Engineering, and uh, will be actually st sorry, starting his PhD in Computational Science and Engineering at McMaster University. And his primary research looks at uh, supply chain big data optimization and e-commerce in last mile logistics. So I'll pass it on to Hader. So Hader, we have your uh, slides, but we still don't have your voice. Maybe there seems to be something. I definitely yeah. can hear you. I, okay, you hear me now? Yes, we hear okay. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your introduction, and I'm so sorry for uh, not having uh, the 10 minutes. Um, uh, I just like have the kind of a problem uh, in my internet connection, uh, but it's already resolved. So I just like to use the other profile that I have on Zoom. Um, thank you for having me here today, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'll be talking about the e-commerce logistics impacts on communities, um, and our two um, um, main research that. Um, has been doing, uh, going uh, uh, in um, McMaster University. Um, uh, I would start with the literature type of, um, uh, or literature review type of research that we um, uh, did recently. Um, in order to find, um, let's say, research gaps in the in e-commerce and online shopping behavior, in addition to their impacts on uh, communities in terms of logistics and supply chain drivers. We did this review and to do uh, to know that what is next to, to be done. So basically, uh, we did the literature review and uh, it is considered as the springboard for our um, uh, next uh, research, which is the e-commerce um, survey. Uh, so the survey actually um, um, we uh, collected data from uh, the residents uh, in the region uh, to assess the behavior and practices. And, uh, and the perspective of the customers themselves uh, in order to um, better and fully understand the last mile delivery and how to um, implement and integrate uh, last mile de delivery technologies. I'll be talking about it um, later on in some uh, more details. Um, so recently the e-commerce uh, has become uh, more indispensable uh, let's say, and it's increasing and, and uh, gaining more attention. Um, that's been found uh, by the literature and the, the number of publications. Um, um, so recently, let's say in the 2019, um, we had a good um, hit in the number of publications that handle, handles this, uh, this topic of e-commerce, uh, e-commerce logistics. So it actually um, consists um, or just like we have around maybe 30 percent of our um, um, literature um, review, uh, basically uh, published uh, in uh, 20, uh, 2019, um, and that actually um, reflects how this um, uh, subject and topic is uh, gaining more um, attention. Uh, in terms of uh, the drivers, uh, the supply chain drivers, um, actually there are um, most there are many drivers. Uh, let's say for warehouse transportation and pricing um, we found that maybe the main two topics or the main two drivers that have been mentioned in um, in the literature review is the transportation and the pricing uh, and um, then uh, we let's say this is the takeaways from the literature review so we found that the focus um, must be more on the last mile delivery and um, last mile delivery refers to this the, the trip, the last trip, and the and the or the last stage in the uh, e-commerce logistics, um, where um, in which the the package will be uh, delivered to the final customers. Uh, in addition, we found that the um, the information flow is kind of lacking uh, along the supply chain, so there's no um, let's say data collection mechanism. Uh, between the supply chain uh, players along the supply chain. And that's actually one of uh, maybe um, uh, what motivates us to do the e-commerce survey in order to gain more data in, in terms of the customer perspective. Um, in addition to that, that there is no, uh, there is a lack of scientific studies that assess the environment and the society and the incorporation um, of in innovative uh, technology in the last mile delivery. 
Um, so here, the literature review, uh, as I said, that it is the spring uh, the springboard for um, our uh, second uh, research, which uh, which is the survey, and we will be plugging uh, the literature review um, uh, research gaps um, and the e-commerce um, survey results into one of our uh, ongoing models uh, that is to uh, estimate the traffic a traffic uh, volume and uh, their impact on society and environment. Uh, let me go here to the e-commerce survey. Oh, I'm just like, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sharing my video here. Okay, so let me go to the e-commerce survey for Peel uh, region. Actually, we hired a company uh, that works on, on the panel survey marketing in order to uh, distribute the survey in accordance to the ethics clearance uh, or ethics board uh, at McMaster University uh, in order to assess the preferences for delivery services. And it is the first study, uh, to best of my knowledge, the first study that uh, estimates and study the e-commerce and online shopping uh, pre and uh, post uh, or pre and during COVID-19. Uh, so would, uh, this would give us more insights about how COVID-19 would actually impact um, the online shopping uh, preferences and uh, online shopping uh, behaviors um, the, from the customer's perspective. And um, then uh, here would, uh, I would talk about the main survey uh, topics and components. Uh, we started the, our uh, survey uh, by writing down the general de demographic questions like the um, question of the number of uh, people in the household, uh, let's say the, uh, the annual income, um, the age, um, gender, um, etc. Uh, and then the shopping behavior, it, uh, um, it is the se second section in our uh, survey. Um, it is about the shopping behavior. Uh, so we, um, we write down these questions in order to um, uh, reflect or take some results for um, uh, the behavior of shopping itself. So, for example, uh, some of the questions that we have there uh, was um, use the Amazon, use um, other, uh, let's say, uh, um, other online um, online platforms. Um, what is the type of the safety precautions that you had? Um, did you? Um, when was the first time you used the online shopping? So, in order to differentiate or distinct between the people who actually joined the um, online shopping. Uh, just recently during the COVID-19 and those who have, um, let's say, more experience using the online shopping uh, before the COVID-19. The third uh, component is the shopping categories. What items, uh, what items people actually more um, uh, reliant on having it from uh, online shopping. Uh, the fourth component is the understanding the carrier, uh, what type of, let's say, uh, delivery or vehicles delivery uh, are around in the neighborhoods. And the second one, the impact of technology. And part of our uh, main goals uh, for the e-commerce uh, survey here is to understand um, the, or to integrate those uh, technologies. Uh, for example, we have the parcel lookers and we have the collection points uh, in order to see uh, how the people are more familiar with it and it can it be uh, as a, a good uh, alternative, uh, given that the, circum the recent circumstances of the COVID-19 uh, around? Uh, in addition, uh, I'm going to go with the demographic here, uh, just like to give a glance about the, the data that we have, uh, or the sociodemographic data that we have. And it's actually uh, accordance to the Stats Canada definition and terminologies. So we have the age groups, uh, maybe the main, um, uh, the main age group that we had actually um, is the people who uh, age from 26 year old to 35 year old. Uh, and the second uh, group uh, is the 46 to 55. Um, based on the gender, um, the female actually um, participate in 62% of the respondents. And uh, then I will be talking about the, the residential communities that we have here. So we did this um, uh, division, let's say, based on the, uh, what we call a forward, uh, forward sortation area, uh, the FSA. And we got it from the first three letters or the, the first three digits from the um, postal code. And then based on that, we divided the area in Peel region 
um, based on the, some of the maps uh, that have been issued earlier from the Peer region and from Canada Post uh, in order to see uh, or in order to categorize our uh, area into uh, urban, suburban and uh, rural. Uh, most of the people are actually from the urban, but here I wanted to just like emphasize that we had some um, participation, uh, a good participation percentage from rural, uh, rural communities. Uh, and we have uh, as well suburban. Uh, and then uh, I want to just like give some findings uh, to grants here uh, that around 30% of um, or 35% of the respondents, respondents stated that they do shop online once a week during the pandemic. Uh, but while the percentage is less than 30% compared to the pandemic. And uh, this bullet just like to show that uh, there is um, a uh, real impact of COVID-19 uh, on the online shopping behavior itself. Um, in addition to the, the safety precautions, the online, high, um, the, let's say the hygiene, the, the type of the grocery, the type of products that people would, uh, would uh, be having uh, using the online shopping. Uh, in addition to that, we, uh, as I said, that we wouldn't see uh, how people would uh, be, um, let's say, familiar with the, the the last mile technologies and alternatives like the collection uh, collection points and uh, parcel lookers and we found that around 80 percent of respondents uh, didn't have let's say or they, they, they weren't familiar with the, those alternatives uh, a prior of having the survey so it is good to to see that our survey actually give them some uh, insight that these alternatives alternatives uh, could be a, a good examples of um, distributing their, um, let's say, packages or their on online shopping uh, orders uh, around in the area. So I think hey that's there, it. just wanted to give you a time notice. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. And so that's it. I want to thank uh, our partner, Regional Peel, and I would uh, like to thank our research team. Um, and I think that's it. And i um, very welcome to have any questions or inquiries uh, to be uh, through the, our uh, email, sfc at mcmaster.ca. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ed. I really appreciate your talk on uh, uh, last mile logistics impacts on communities. Our next speaker is uh, C. Liu, who is a PhD candidate at the management uh, uh, program at uh, McMaster University. He holds a master's degree in sustainable energy technology and a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And his research is going to look at applications of novel transportation methods in the last mile delivery. With that, I'll pass it on to Steve. Okay, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Liu, and uh, I'm from McMaster University. It's really my great honor to do my presentation today. So I hope all of you can see my slides right now. And the title of my presentation today is Mobile Locker Storage Locations and Allocations. Actually, I think uh, most of you are loyal users of Amazon or eBay, and uh, you are experiencing last mile yourself. And actually, last mile delivery is a critical component of the e-commerce supply chain. And actually, right now, we have several challenges for the last mile deliveries. And the first one is the frequent illegal or legal curbside parking. As you can see here, this is the picture of downtown Toronto. And we already have a Canada Post delivery truck parking here, and another FedEx delivery truck is trying to join join him, right? And it creates uh, extra congestions. And another challenge is that uh, the introduction of these delivery trucks, they introduce traffic congestions, All right. okay? And uh, one of the popular current solution is uh, fixed lockers, as you can see here. And it can operate 24 hours, but uh, it also has several limitations. The first one is it needs extra occupancy space, right? And second one that it may demand high or expensive construct construction cost, and uh, the utilization may be low. For example, if you inserted a parcel into the locker slot in the morning, and the customers may pick it up in the late evening, so you cannot do anything in the slot during this like eight or not nine hours uh, time period, right? But we have another solution. 
So actually, the purpose of design of my presentation is a mobilized lockers. And the idea is to combine the smart lockers together with the city buses. Okay, the, the design is to be operated in partnership with public transit. And it has to use and route based on demand. For example, if we know the demands on like in Hamilton, number 51 routes, right? So we can arrange how many smart lockers we assign to the city buses. And it has several key advantages. The first one is that we use existing transient infrastructure like terminals and bus stops, and we don't need the extra infrastructures. And the second one is that we can minimize curbside parking because when the bus is parking at the bus stop, so the lockers can also serve the customers, which means that we don't need extra parking areas for the delivery trucks or the smart lockers. And it may encourage more transient ridership because maybe more passengers, they would like to pick up their parcels from the smart lockers attached to the city buses. So here is another two simple illustration of our design. So here is the upper wheel of my design. So we have a bus here and we have smart mobilized lockers attached to the bus. And this is the parking area, for example, in bus terminals, so like bus stops. And this is a front wheel of the smart mobilized lockers. So you can see we have 18 smart slots in this design. And on the right hand, we have scanners that customers can use to scan their barcodes to open the slots. And here we have some LED lights, which they can flash when the customers want to pick up their parcels in a slot and can direct the customers to their slots. Here is another brief illustration of the service process. So the first step is that the merchants, they insert the parcels into the slots, right? And in the meantime, they will send the, the messages to the customers, which includes the, the, the number of the slots of the smart lockers, right? And which bus they are attached. And actually the next step is that uh, the customers, they can use the applications, mobile applications to track their parcels because a smart locker is attached to the bus and many of the buses, they are installed with GPS. So they know where their parcels is. And actually, <clears throat> as long as they know where their parcel is, so they can expect when their uh, parcels will arrive. So they can arrange to arrive at the bus stop, maybe like 30 seconds or one minute before the bus arrives. And as soon as the bus arrives, the bus will load and unload the passengers and the customers they can scan their barcode uh, at the smart lockers and they can get their parcels. Here's another illustration of the, how the service is operating on a bus route. As you can see here, we have a bus route from one terminal to another terminal, right? So at the terminal, we have merchants who will uh, insert their parcels into the smart mobilized lockers. As soon as they insert the parcels, the bus together with the smart mobilized lockers will travel to the next point. In this case, it's going to be a service bus point stop, which means that uh, the customers will pick up their parcels at this bus stop. And, the, and, and merchants can also insert their parcels at this bus stops. And at other uh, non-service bus stops, which means that we have no customers, the, the bus will load and unload passengers as usual. There's no influence on it. And on the right hand, actually, is uh, uh, a screenshot of a Google map from Brampton in Pierce region. So I'll, the, here is an example that we have a bus route uh, in one of the main streets of Brampton, right? And actually, these blue dots, they are the bus stops. And actually, in this case, they're the service bus stops. And we're assuming that so within these red circles, the customers, they are willing to go to the bus stops and pick up their parcels from the smart mobile lockers. So in this case, you can see that uh, this design can cover quite uh, a lot of the area and can service the customers. Okay, so the current research investigation, uh, so we are developing several applications for the development of this service. The first one is locker locations and how can we uh, de uh, determine the number and the location of lockers depending on daily demand. And the next one is parcel to locker assignment, so which parcels to store in a given locker and at which slot. And third one is locker routing. So we're assigning uh, lockers to which bus routes and how 
we can schedule them. And the, the last one is customer pickup. So how can we schedule a customer pickup? So there are like four main issues and we're making progress in, in each of them. There are also some future research work here. And the, the first one is we have to understand the impact on transient service time. Of course, we don't want to slow down the regular bus service too much. And second one is we want to benchmark our solution with other last mile delivery solutions, especially some novel solutions like the, the drones and autonomous uh, small vehicles, right? And uh, right now we're also thinking about to, to do a pilot study. So uh, that's why we welcome the discussion with transient operators, retailers and local manufacturers. So I think that's all for my presentation. So I thank you for all your listening and I welcome any discussions. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Um, so this brings us to the end of our presentations. I wanna thank all of our speakers for doing a great job presenting their work. I uh, really enjoyed all of them. And uh, I ask that everybody turn on their, all the speakers turn on their cameras. I think we have everybody. Okay. Um, if you could do that, it would be great. Um, so we did receive uh, quite a few questions. What I'll do is for the sake of being fair, I'll ask every person, every presenter one question. And then if there's time, I'll uh, cycle back again. So in the order that the presentations were given, I'll start off with Soha. Uh, so our question for you is, is the research only focusing on freight or is it also focusing on other vehicles like uh, passenger cars? And um, my follow-up question on that would be, do you, your final, your finding from the research uh, do these uh, lane priorities make sense at the end of the day? Is like three minutes, do you think, significant enough to make these impl implementations and things like that? Um, yes. Uh, so though we are focusing just on freight, we are also focusing on improving the travel time for all the vehicles. So it also includes passenger car. So we have also uh, developed data for passenger car. And yes, there is travel time saving for passenger cars as well. And uh, about the three minutes uh, travel time saving, I think uh, it is uh, actually considerable that uh, there is a three minute time saving for uh, the trucks. So yeah, I think it is, it is significant. Because it adds up, right? If you yeah. consider the flow of trucks on these roads and yeah, it's maybe yes. three minutes for one vehicle, but it really adds up when you. Uh, yes. Okay, but... thank you. I think that should be emphasized. Okay. Great, and we'll cycle back to you. Thank you for the for the explanation there. I'll uh, move on to Ravi now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of questions that has been asked, Ravi. One is in regards to implementation of TSP systems in Calgary. I think that can be taken offline. But one of the questions that uh, is also a question for me is that we have different priorities for traffic lights, like emergency, transit, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please explain the possibility of integrating all these priorities in one model? And my follow-up on that is, can we apply the same TSP model we have for transit to trucks, or do we need to modify these? What makes trucks uh, uh, unique that we need to modify the existing models for them? So uh, we can definitely integrate between the truck signal priority and the transit signal priority. The main difference here is the check-in detectors, which are used to detect the trucks or the transit system. So based on how you are detecting the transit, it depends whether you can use the same uh, same detection system for the trucks. So once you're uh, the same, the all other the signal controller and every other component within the, uh, within the transit signal priority can be used for truck signal priority and vice versa. But you cannot combine both of them together because it might sometimes create uh, a longer green time for one of the corridor and the other corridor will not be getting uh, sufficient green time. Either they would be getting just the minimum green time which would increase the travel time for the other, uh, other vehicles which are on the other legs. Of course, there may be conflicting priorities, yes. uh, but let me ask you, do we, do we even have places in, let's say, Ontario where, you know, we have uh, an abundance of trucks and, uh, and buses? Do we have cases like these? 
especially along the major like platforms. I would assume yeah. that the region of Peel has a lot of trucks and downtown Toronto yeah. has a lot of buses but do we yeah. have places where we have both of these uh, you know in conflict with each other are you familiar with anywhere uh, I don't think I'm fam- I'm not familiar but as much as I'm familiar uh, with the situation I don't think there is a major conflict between both of them uh, even when there is uh, it is the uh, the transit vehicles are very less frequent so where the trucks are have heavy frequent so the transit vehicles are not so frequent along those roads exactly exactly so yeah maybe that is, might not always be the biggest yeah. uh, it might it might not happen where we have a lot of conflict yeah, yeah okay thank you so much for that yeah, our sure. next question is for Haider um, so the question is, uh, can you elaborate the specific impacts that uh, uh, on communities that the survey is going to address? What, exa- what exactly are we going to cover there? Okay, um, as I said that we're trying to, um, we have like um, many goals that we can just like pull up from the survey. The survey is um, so rich in, in data. Uh, let's say just like the five, components that I showed you in the presentations, understanding the carrier and um, the shopping behavior, the online shopping behavior and uh, during the COVID-19. Um, for us, let's say um, at least we will just like be building our models. Um, um, let's say that the traffic uh, volume, the traffic flow, and uh, the e-commerce logistics. Uh, and we, got, we wanna just like see uh, all these um, things uh, through the eyes of the customers themselves. So that's maybe the, let's say, the ultimate goal that we have here. Um, the, the e-commerce would serve um, different um, different goals, different research, and let's say uh, even public goals. And I believe so that region of Beale would, uh, would actually um, uh, take um, some of the results and it will be maybe uh, the benefits for, for their plans, let's say for the community uh, themselves. So yeah. Fantastic, I completely agree. Would you also tell us a little bit about more, at least like one of the policies that you think your survey will be useful in assessing? Okay, so for the policy, um, so for the policy that we are um, assessing, uh, let me say that um, right now, we are in the, um, the data, let's say, data analysis and uh, the, the assessment of uh, the policy would be uh, for, um, just give me a second here. Yeah, so for the policy that we will be assessing is um, um, anything that's related to, let's say, customer, um, uh, customer behalf. Uh, that's one hand. The other hand that we will be uh, maybe um, uh, in cal- collaboration, I will be in touch with, uh, let's say, with our research partners and with uh, those carriers in order to uh, obtain maybe the best optimum um, um, ideas and uh, alternatives in the last mile delivery. So we are assessing the policies of um, uh, satisfied the customers in the region of, uh, in the region of field um, and. Our, our plan is maybe to expand our, um, our models and our survey uh, results uh, to represent or to be implemented in other areas in, in Canada, through Canada, uh, if it's applicable. Thank you for that. I think one of the other interesting policies to look at is uh, freight on transit, like C was uh, mentioning. I think that'll be something very interesting to see how you know, customers behave, behave with respect to these types of delivery systems. Thank you so much, Ada. Yeah. We'll move on to the question for our final speaker. The first question is, uh, so this idea of, you know, putting packages on, on buses, this is only for small parcels, uh, correct? Uh, so maybe you can validate that. And if that's the case, this concept is applicable for the delivery in residential areas and maybe not for commercial industrial areas. Can you comment on that, C, please? Uh, as, 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 as long as we have bus stops, we can like arrange any smart lockers to serve the customers. But right now we are only considering to serve small small parcels that can like serve the commercial areas or residential areas. Yeah. Uh, very good, I agree with you. One of my questions was uh, when you had the circles around the transit stations, are those uh, 
Does that mean that that's the service radius of the people that are within that uh, within the uh, proximity of that bus stop are able to go and pick up their packages from there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there is a little bit of a burden on the receivers to actually, well, it's not a huge burden because you're probably close to the busy stations, but you do have to go and do the pickup. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I mean, we don't need any new trucks in this case. Yeah. Yes. I really like the technology as and the business case that you put forward. I think it was uh, very creative. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So this brings us to the end of uh, our session. I want to thank all of the speakers for the wonderful presentations. And I want to ask uh, the audience for asking great questions. And I think we had a great discussion at the end. Thank you all so much. I'll pass it on to our moderator. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, first session. Great to uh, speak speeches uh, as well as a good answer for uh, excellent questions. So we are going to have a short break and then we are going to back uh, on the session to at 1010. So please uh, uh, take a short uh, health break and then we'll meet soon. Thank you. Um, hello everyone. So once again, uh, we are going to start session two under the title of uh, Future Free Transportation. Uh, the moderator for the session is Dr. Kareh uh, uh, Emer Jamish Shidi. I hope I, can, I um, spoke her name properly. And she is a senior transport engineer at Parsons uh, with academic research and practical hands-on experience in freight plant, uh, planning, logistics, and e-commerce. Uh, focusing on transportation and urban freight modeling and optimization. So welcome, Dr. Korea. Uh, I appreciate your uh, facilitating for the session number two. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Uh, welcome everyone to the second session of today's Smart Freight Symposium. Uh, we have four speakers with us. Uh, for those of us who just joined us, uh, we have a Q&A session at the end. Make sure you type your questions in the chat box. So, with that, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker. Uh, Daniel Olejars is a recent master graduate from the University of Toronto working at IBI Group. His research focused on improving the efficiency of urban freight systems through the use of emerging technologies. And he's presenting today on assessing the use of autonomous ground vehicles uh, for parcel delivery in a mall. Daniel, all yours. Yes, good morning. Just bear with me, please, while I get the screen sharing sorted out. Uh, I hope everyone can see and hear me okay. We can hear you. We can, s and we can see you, but we don't see your screen yet. Okay, here we go. How about, how about that? Uh, now we do. Oh, perfect. Okay, so good morning, and thank you for the introduction, Galera. Um, in this presentation, I'll give you a bit of a snippet of my master's research. Uh, this has been an investigation on automating last mile parcel delivery inside of an indoor space. So in the next 10 minutes, I'll give you a bit of an overview of some of the challenges in last mile parcel delivery, many challenges that I'm sure you're all familiar with as freight professionals. I'll give you an overview of automation as it currently exists in the freight transport industry. Uh, the bulk of our presentation will be, of course, the case study. And then I'll conclude with some discussion and recommendations on implementation of some of the results. So diving right in with some challenges in last mile parcel delivery. So I'll start with a, a chart that will surprise no one. E-commerce is booming. Um, and I can speak to my own experiences that we've gone in about 10 years from wondering if we're gonna get scammed on the internet to some people buying almost everything online. And so this has been a massive shift in the way courier companies operate as these are the companies that facilitate most e-commerce uh, deliveries. But courier companies have had their business model shaken up as well. When you compare business to business to business to consumer shipments, which make up the majority of e-commerce shipments, uh, there are some pretty significant differences. And I'll, I'd like to focus on the bottom two, especially. The e-commerce segment is growing. The business to consumer segment is growing significantly faster than the business to business segment. 
but for courier companies, the business to business segment is much more profitable. And so courier companies see automation as a key driver in a way for them to reduce their costs in business to consumer shipments and ultimately make them more profitable. So moving on to theme number two, automation and freight transport. So these are sort of three thoughts that I have as to why I see automation as inevitable in freight. At the top of the list is firms are profit seeking. A majority of freight transportation happens by for-profit firms. And we've already discussed how B2C shipments are growing at a faster rate. And these firms are investing heavily in automation to reduce that cost. Number two is that firms control large fleets. When you have a large homogenous fleet of vehicles, regardless of what type of vehicle it is, it's much easier to implement any sort of standardized automated technology than it is when you have vehicles from many different manufacturers, such as what you see on the passenger transportation network with private vehicles. And then sort of the, the biggest idea, if you ask me, is that it's already existed for years. There are various aspects of automation in the freight supply chain um, today. Most of those aspects, however, are sort of in areas that are controlled by freight carriers. I have this large scale example, which is the port of Rotterdam. You have these uh, sort of small, well, they're actually not small at all, but they look small in this picture, uh, aut autonomous vehicles that carry uh, shipping containers around. So really not small at all. Um, and then you have on the flip side of that uh, inside warehouses where a lot of the sorting happens, much of that process is automated. But as soon as you exit the area that's controlled by freight companies, the amount of automation tends to reduce a little bit. But more recently, you're starting to see this uh, in a practical context. In China, a company called JD has been piloting uh, autonomous deliveries during the COVID-19 pandemic. And very recently, this is actually a headline from this week, uh, Loblaw has announced that they're gonna be looking into autonomous deliveries for, <coughs> excuse me, uh, warehouse to retail shipments. So there's signs that this is starting now. In my research, I've come across four major vehicle types that are receiving the most amount of investment and attention by courier companies and vehicle manufacturers. Semi-autonomous trucks, where you have a driver actually in the truck, but they're free to do other tasks such as sorting and labeling. Drones, I'm sure we've all seen very hype videos about Amazon's drones where you see uh, these aerial vehicles flying with parcels. Uh, droids, which are small, uh, ground vehicles with room for one parcel delivery, and then autonomous ground vehicles, what I like to call the filing cabinet on wheels. You see uh, a few different drawers where you have room for multiple deliveries worth of parcels, and that's on top of uh, an autonomous, uh, autonomously moving base. So diving into our uh, case study, first a bit of project context. Uh, in this project, we've partnered with a major courier company operating in Canada. Uh, that was interested in reducing the time and cost of deliveries inside Square One Mall, a large shopping center in Mississauga inside Peel region. Uh, this exact autonomous vehicle you can see on the left was the, the vendor that they were in, initially collaborating with, but the idea was just to see how much time and cost could be saved if a system like this was to be implemented. So when we're talking about uh, deliveries in a shopping mall, going back to our big four vehicle types, uh, trucks are obviously not feasible. I'm sure there would be many issues involved in driving a truck through a shopping mall. Uh, drones, I'm also going to say, are not feasible. Drones are particularly advantageous when you have situations where you can skip over large elements of a network. You can think of like a large rural network where uh, distances between deliveries are very far. Or you can think of areas where there is no uh, street network at all. If it's like uh, really like, uh, how do I put it, undeveloped land at all. You can skip over areas where there's no roads. Um, in our context, we also ruled out droids. We felt that having only room for one parcel negated a lot of the effects and would require a lot of uh, human intervention to constantly reload these uh, vehicles. And so we settled on the autonomous ground vehicle. We figured that it was the nice balance of um, parcel capacity as well as uh, potential to reduce costs. So I went on a site tour with our courier partner and I made one very significant observation. Uh, there are two major types of deliveries that the company deals with. The first is uh, large inventory shipments, as you see on the image on the left. This is one store's worth of deliveries. And as you can see, it's a pretty significant volume. Um, and then on the right, there are e-commerce fulfillment and returns. So this is many different stores receiving, may, receiving or sending one, maybe two parcels. And the thought here that I notice is that let's leave the deliveries on the left, the significant inventory shipments to the human courier. They already have an established business relationship with the clients. 
Uh, and we can pay me, maybe automate these uh, e-commerce fulfillment and returns that are less profitable currently. So our process was that we take the pickups and deliveries for all stores, sort them whether they fit into the vehicle or not. If they didn't fit in the vehicle, they would be delivered manually. And if they do fit in the vehicle, they would be uh, automatically delivered. You take the max of the pickups and deliveries as the demand. We don't consider pickups and deliveries separately in this research. And you route the autonomous ground vehicle for use when uh, all pickups and deliveries fit in the, uh, into the vehicle. And then you use the courier for deliveries uh, where not everything can fit inside of the autonomous ground vehicle. So we developed this synchronized split de delivery routing problem. Uh, it mitigates the inconvenience of split deliveries arriving at different times. I can go into the details of this offline with anyone that wants to look into it. Similarly, we have a heuristic solution that I'd be happy to share in detail if anyone wants that. Um, and then comparing the two, the courier has a capacity of 120 and then the autonomous ground vehicle, two, six or 12. And this is number of standardized parcels. And then the courier costs 10 times more and there's some slight differences in speed. Um, and then this is the major result. You can see that the percent stores that the autonomous ground vehicle can serve has the biggest impact on uh, cost savings. Capacity has an impact, but less so than the percentage of stores uh, served by the AGV. And wrapping things up with some recommendations, um, we can see, like I said, that penetration has a larger impact than vehicle capacity does on cost savings. But it's important to realize that this is very much like a maximum theoretical savings. It requires a seamless implementation where everyone knows what they're doing and stores are willing to receive parcels from uh, these automated vehicles. Limitations of the study is that the three other delivery modes are not considered. That would make for an interesting study if you ask me, uh, one that compares the four different modes. Uh, square one at the mall is still a relatively small geography. It's not fair to say that these results can immediately be extrapolated to uh, perhaps a large urban area. The loading time of the vehicles is not considered and uh, the method that we use still requires an exact solution to an optimization problem. And for uh, people that are familiar with these types of solutions, you know that as you scale these up, um, computational times become infeasible. Oh, excuse me, my last slide, some final recommendation is to start using AGVs for small volume deliveries. We've seen that any amount of uh, automated deliveries reduces costs. So that's an encouraging result for courier companies. Uh, also piloting the technology with a supervisor to start. Um, this image that you can see on the right is a cleaning robot that I happened to stumble upon inside of a different shopping mall and completely independent of the project. And I noticed that a lot of people were like messing around with it. You would see like kids kicking at it and uh, people getting in its way to try to mess it up. I don't know if they were just trying to have fun. And so my final recommendation is to avoid busy days to start. Uh, based on what I saw, people are still seeing these as, as like toys and novel things and they'll really do their best to get in their way uh, just to mess around with it. Uh, and so keeping that in mind and in terms of implementation is important. So coming up to 10 minutes, I'll thank you all for your attention and happy to take questions at the end of uh, the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, very interesting presentation indeed. Our next speaker is Tanvir Cowdery. Uh, Tanvir is a PhD student at York University. Uh, he has four years of industry experience, which includes World Bank funded, World Bank funded infrastructure development projects. He was the past president of the CIT York University from 2019 to 2020. Sorry, he was a president at the time. And as president, they won the CIT Outstanding Student Chapter of the Year. Uh, Tamir, we you have your screen. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Lara, and good morning, everyone. Uh, at first, actually, before I start my presentation, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Peter Park, for his enormous support for conducting this research. And I would also like to thank all the speakers, uh, industry folks, and uh, faculties who are who have participated on this in this present uh, SFC symposium to make it successful. Uh, since morning, we have seen lots of uh, logistic researchers have shown how goods movement serves as a fuel for the development of our society. Today, I'm going to talk on one of my research topic. That one is impact of truck platooning on two-lane uh, highway in North America. 
nowadays um, the most imminent and promising v2v technology in um, goods movement uh, uh, industry will be the semi or fully um, the, um, truck platooning which refers to two or more uh, trucks wirelessly connected to travel as a convey the society of uh, engineers um, proposed that uh, the drivers uh, automation level from 0 to level uh, 5 where the level 5 means that uh, it will replace a uh, human drive humans drivers interaction completely with the machine machine yeah so if we uh, see the um, the, in our roadway, we have long combination vehicle right now running. And um, in terms of length, the long combination vehicle and truck platooning are quite similar. But uh, we could see there is a lots of um, uh, enormous amount of benefit for uh, socioeconomic aspects uh, for the truck platooning. If we could see that here, we have a, a six to 10% fuel consumption benefit uh, for truck platooning. And we could also uh, eliminate the driver shortage problem, which is one of the major concern in North America. Uh, in uh, North America, there are several jurisdictions have started their testing on the autonomous truck platooning. Uh, here you could see the Ontario truck platooning network where you could see that the blue lines indicating that there are a few segments where we are test, um, the truck platooning testing is ongoing and all of these are freeway but in if we think about the whole uh, uh, transportation system we cannot ignore the importance of the two lane uh, rural highway so in the two lane rural highway the passing side distance is one of the uh, the major factor which uh, to for the design safety and operational performance Educate passing side distance is essential for faster moving vehicle to overtake slower moving vehicles such as uh, trucks. Passing side distance also affects the level of service of the two lane rural highway. So this begs a question that um, it, will it be safe for other vehicles like passenger vehicle traveling along the same two lane rural highways? So that's why we have uh, picked uh, two objectives on this research to estimate one is to estimate the appropriate passing side distance for truck platooning and long combination vehicle on North America in two lane rural highways using an analytical and simulation method. And the next objective is to compare the passing side distance uh, estimated for truck platooning and long combination vehicle with the passing uh, side distance suggested in the North American highway geometric design standard. From the literature review, what we have identified that there is no evidence we indicates the, the impact of passing side distance for truck platooning. So that's why uh, we have used um, uh, we have used the Glennon mathematical model. We modified that and proposed a new model. Here in the in this chart, you could see the outcome from the analytical model. The blue line indicating us that uh, tech. Um, geometric design guideline passing side distance and the red line is indicating as the ASHTO 2018 passing side distance. And here for the truck platooning, we have considered WB20 truck as a, um, which will make the convey. So what we could see that when the, um, for the, all the truck platooning, uh, the passing side distance requirement are increasing. Uh, the result also showed that the 2017 uh, tech passing side distance is sufficient to allow cars to overtake two or three truck platooning on the two lane rural highway in Canada. However, 2018 passing side, uh, Ashto passing side distance is not sufficient to accommodate that. And res result also indicating that passing side distance requirement is almost 1 to 5, 1 1.5 to 1.8 times more at nine, 90 kilometer design speed than the 2018 Ashto geometric design guideline. The traveling lane, opposing lane, traveling, traffic volume, driving behavior, vehicle acceleration, deacceleration, traffic composition. There are lots of factors actually, which um, plays a vital role on the overtaking maneuver on the two lane rural highway. So that's why we have considered three traffic scenario environment. The scenario in the scenario one, the traffic uh, volume is higher. And the, in the scenario three, the traffic volume is lower. So what we could see from here, we have considered uh, developed this model in using a micro simulation using Vizim. And what we could see that we observed that in all HCV platooning condition, overtaking maneuver occurs at less than a uh, thousand meter distance. It has been noticed that in all three 
conditions, traffic scenario, environment, approximately 75% passenger vehicle has completed passing maneuver of uh, LCV tag and LCV um, turn peak double within the Pashto, Ashto passing side distance. That is a uh, which is 440 meter. However, in all three scenarios, less than 25% passenger vehicle accomplished the overtaking maneuver of two or three truck platooning uh, according to uh, Ashto passing side distance. On the other hand, more than 75% passenger vehicle uh, has finished the overtaking maneuver of two or three truck platooning within 2017 um, tech of passing side distance, which is 860 meter. So what we have learned from here, the, find, the major finding is uh, that uh, the passing statistics estimated for uh, overtaking and ACV platooning were more than those overtaking long combination vehicle. The result also showed that 2017 tech passing side distance provides sufficient passing side distance for a passenger vehicle to pass all six ACV um, uh, yeah, all six track options and um, over the entire speed range. But uh, on the contrary, we could see that um, 2018 Ashto passing side distance uh, provides inadequate passing side distance uh, for them. Um, on the other hand, uh, the simulation um, result also also showed us that the result is not identical and the simulation result showed that clearly 2018 passing side distance does not provide sufficient length for the passenger vehicle to overtake. The 2017 passing side distance, uh, 2017 tech passing side distance provide a sufficient length for a passenger vehicle to pass to um, long combination vehicle options and good enough length for the passenger vehicle to pass a uh, two truck platooning, uh, but it is well short of uh, the required um, 20, uh, 85th percentile uh, overtaking distance for, the, for operating uh, three truck platooning. The simulation result also showed that it appears to be very challenging for a passenger vehicle to pass a uh, three truck platooning. So the both uh, simulation, uh, analytical and simulation more, uh, analysis uh, results suggest us that many existing two-lane highway uh, design, um, designated in accordance with the passing side distance requirement in 20, uh, 2004 Ashto or 2017 TAG guideline uh, could be used for long combination vehicle and two truck platooning may be feasible on two-lane rural highway that meet uh, 2004 Ashto and 2017 tech guideline for passing side distance. But we suggest providing frequent passing land on highway sec section designated for uh, two truck platooning um, would be reduced possible safety concern. Uh, and then I would like to thank um, um, I would like to uh, show my gratitude to York University and Smart Spirit Center for funding this research project. And I would like to also thank uh, IT York University student chapter for arranging lots of training sessions, which helped me to enhance my skill to conduct this research project. Uh, here are the references what I have used for this research, and I'm happy to thank you. take the question. Thank you, Tanvir. Uh... Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. We'll keep questions until the end. And we'll move on to our third presenter. Uh, Alia Gallo is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. Her PhD research combines freight transportation, human factors, and traffic safety as she analyzes truck driver skills and behavior using a truck simulator. Her research aim is to improve traffic and vulnerable road user safety in Canada and worldwide. Uh, Alia, we have your presentation. Uh, hi everyone, it's my pleasure uh, doing this presentation today. I hope you can all hear and see me. Uh, great. Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm Alia and today in the coming few minutes I'll be talking about my research topic for, for my PhD, which is uh, trucks and vulnerable road user interactions uh, and safety interactions using a truck simulator. So before jumping directly to my research topic, I would like to... 
to, to point your attention to some alarming facts. So for instance, uh, research has revealed that around 1.2 million pedestrians uh, die in road collisions yearly uh, in the world and about 50 million others get injured uh, in road collisions. So this is, this is too much. Uh, and on a more local scale in, in the city of Toronto from 2006 to 2019, uh, it is found that uh, vulnerable road users are involved in about 69% of fatal collisions. And by vulnerable road users, I mean mainly pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, concerning truck crashes, these are found to be uh, much more severe than uh, crashes with other vehicles, such as passenger cars and uh, other smaller vehicles and especially when uh, pedestrians or cyclists are involved. So one study said that uh, pedestrians are two to four times more likely to be severely injured or die in a truck collision. Uh, and the figure to the right here, um, the, the, the line graph shows the proportion of pedestrian fatalities along, uh, along the years uh, in, in the province of Ontario. And it's, it's alarming and it's increasing over the years, although uh, the, the fatalities, the, the general fatalities on the road uh, keep uh, decreasing over the years. So something here is, isn't working well. Um, so uh, while doing my literature review, I found that there, there are many factors that, that contribute in and lead to uh, truck VRU crashes. Um, I won't really go deep into uh, details uh, about each, each, each of these factors, but uh, research has uh, only uh, categorized them into four categories, which are, which are location-related factors, infrastructure-related factors, vehicle-related factors, and driver-related factors. Uh, one of the reasons I'm not go going uh, into detail uh, about these factors is that uh, the strongest predictor actually is not uh, among these factors, but the stronger, strongest predictor for truck crashes is uh, driver error. And that is uh, mainly caused by one of three things, either recognition errors, decision errors, or distractions. Uh, and in my research, I, I just focused on one of them, which is the, the decision errors, one, one type of decision errors uh, of truck drivers, which is hazard anticipation. Uh, so the term hazard anticipation itself can be divided into four uh, points or four steps. So to, so to, to anticipate the hazard, uh, uh, a truck driver should first be aware of the traffic, uh, traffic risks and the, the, the associated threats to safety. Uh, he, he should be then able to, to visually search and detect the elements that contribute to, to these uh, unsafe situations. And based on that, he, he should be predicting uh, any hidden or latent hazards that could materialize. And then uh, he, he should give his response accordingly and therefore avoid conflicts. Uh, so uh, since, since this topic is a little bit different than anything that, that has been discussed in, in this symposium so far, uh, I thought of mentioning quickly what latent hazards are. So latent hazards, as, as it appears in the picture, uh, are potential threats that have not explicitly materialized yet. Like, um, like in this picture, uh, we see a cross uh, uh, that the pedestrians may be crossing uh, to, uh, in front of that big uh, truck. So, but but the the, the truck that, or the the driver that's uh, approaching this uh, um, uh, uh, blue area isn't seeing uh, or doesn't have a, uh, a clear vision uh, to the to the to pedestrians. So these are the latent hazards, and these are the areas that that uh, drivers or truck drivers should be uh, specifically aware of. Uh, and then I, I dig uh, a little bit into the, the truck driver training and truck driver training standards in Canada. So in, in a survey study uh, for truck uh, drivers or Canadian truck drivers, many truck drivers uh, said that the training standards in Canada specifically are inadequate because they do not prepare the truck drivers to drive in certain settings such as uh, mountainous or slippery roads, which are basically uh, very popular in, in Canada. And uh, more, many, many uh, truck drivers recommended that uh, the, the truck driver training um, module should, should include more behind the wheel training and not only rely on uh, classroom training. 
Uh, another, in another study, uh, it was revealed that also by truck drivers that uh, simulator-based training um, uh, is, is very beneficial for them. Uh, however, um, many, many of the surveyed uh, truck drivers suggested that uh, the program should be, should be better implemented uh, and the, the, driver, the, the truck driving simulator should be um, taken as a serious training tool. Uh, some of them also mentioned that the driving environment should be made more realistic. So based on uh, everything I, I mentioned, uh, I developed a, a research plan with the aim of improving the truck vulnerable road user interaction through the development of uh, hazard anticipation training and testing procedure. Uh, and for that, I, I will be using two main uh, state-of-the-art um, equipment. So first, a truck simulator. Um, so we decided to uh, to purchase a truck simulator that's top of the line. Uh, it's it's a quarter cab heavy truck uh, mini sim developed by the University of Iowa NADS, uh, and that has the benefit of uh, being of having a, a very high validity and reality in the in the driving environment. Along with that, I will also be using uh, some eye tracking glasses that the participants will have to wear uh, while doing the experiment. And uh, through through those two um, pieces of equipment, I will be examining examining whether participants uh, or truck drivers perform the necessary checks uh, to, to, to detect and to anticipate vulnerable road users. Um, besides, the, the, the in-vehicle distractions will, uh, will also be examined and whether they affect the, the truck driver's uh, latent hazard anticipation skills. Uh, so, uh, in just just very quickly, my my summary of uh, the, the summary of the tasks I will be doing uh, is first I, I will do some uh, online interviews with uh, truck driver trainers and um, hopefully others uh, um, subject matter experts. Um, we we are partnering with a truck driver training school called Chat Musket, um, through which we'll we'll um, we'll gather some information and uh, have access to to uh, interview inter interviewees. Uh, however, I'm I'm pretty open to any suggestions about where to or if anyone is interested in getting involved in such interviews or uh, is able to provide me with any other resources. Um, based on the on the online interviews and the, the literature review I'll be doing, uh, I will create some simulator scenarios um, for specifically for truck driver um, latent hazard anticipation skills. Uh, these after finishing these scenarios, the the, the participants will take uh, part in the in the experiment through um, driving in the simulator. Uh, the and we, while wearing the um, the, eye, the the eye checking glasses and then the, the data will be then analyzed uh, and based on these data uh, some training and testing modules uh, particularly for latent hazard anticipation skills will be um, uh, um, developed and then these these modules will be uh, validated uh, uh, I'm currently in the in the starting phase of this research. However, the the expected contributions are uh, that, to to the best of my knowledge, uh, this uh, will be the first uh, study on truck drivers vulnerable road user uh, related latent hazard anticipation skills. Uh, so uh, at the end, uh, I'm hopefully coming up with uh, a training and testing procedure for improving uh, this skill in truck drivers. And um, based bit on that, the expected result is uh, that the safety um, between trucks and vulnerable road user will be significantly improved, especially in Toronto and or uh, into in Ontario and in in all over Canada. Uh, so to wrap up my talk, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just mentioning that uh, um, the, the problem is real, so something needs to be done. And uh, to, to improve that, I'll be, uh, I'll be using a truck simulator and uh, hopefully the results will improve safety. These are my references and thank you for- Thank for you, this. Elia. We look forward to uh, having more presentations from you on when you have more results. It's a very interesting plan. Our last presenter for this session 
is Mehdi Meshkani. Uh, Mehdi started his PhD student at Ryan University in 2018, and his research focuses on the development of on-demand shared mobility systems to optimally design city-scale ride-sharing and ride-hailing algorithms. Mehdi, please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. hello, everybody. I hope you are doing well. Uh, my name is Mehdi uh, from Ryerson University uh, under the supervision of Dr. Bilal Farouk. Uh, my presentation is on multimodal autonomous <clears throat> last mile delivery systems design and application. The table of contents uh, includes uh, motivation and the research significance, methodology, case study, and results. Uh, today, uh, we have congestion due to uh, urbanization. Based on the statistics, 55% of world's population lives in urban areas, and this number is expected to increase to 68% by 2050. Uh, global urbanization increases the demand of um, freight transportation. The condition due to uh, freight transportation have uh, several reasons. Conflict between freight and passenger services, increase in e-commerce and the one-day delivery services, restrictions on the operational hours of freight movement in urban areas, and uh, parking limitations within uh, congested areas. In Canada, in the food delivery industry, uh, the revenue is expected uh, to show an annual growth rate of 10.2% by 2023. Uh, also, users' market penetration rate is expected to reach 39.4% uh, in 2023. So we need to take a pro proactive approach by incorporating uh, new technologies uh, for last mile delivery system. In this research, we investigate the operational design and efficiency by applying autonomous ground vehicles and autonomous uh, aerial vehicles for last mile food delivery services within a highly populated urban area. Uh, this research uh, will help companies comprehend the benefits of um, using intelligent transportation in order to reduce the delivery times and maximize their profit. Uh, in this study, we developed uh, four systems, um, the robot systems, ground systems, and two hybrid systems. The first system is a robot system. Uh, customers uh, place their orders throughout the network. Um, dispatcher uh, records some information, uh, package ID, uh, request time, um, restaurant note, and home note. Uh, the matching process is based on um, first and first out. Uh, dispatcher finds available robots and assigns the closest robot to a uh, restaurant uh, to the order. And the, the navigation process is based on such of uh, shortest path algorithm. Uh, the um, robot uh, goes to the restaurant location, pick up the uh, food package, and uh, drop it off at uh, the home location. And uh, once the order is delivered, uh, robots uh, will be available and uh, it stays at that location uh, waiting uh, for the next order. Uh, the second system is the drone system. Uh, again, customers place their orders, the dispatchers record uh, some uh, information. Uh, in, in this system, because drones are considered the uh, highest uh, vehicles compared to robots, uh, we consider a uh, 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 meal preparation uh, or food preparation time, uh, which is added to uh, each request time. Uh, again, the matching process is based on uh, First and first out, uh, the dispatcher uh, finds available drones and uh, uh, assigns the closest uh, drone to a restaurant uh, to the order. <clears throat> the navigation process uh, here is based on um, a straight uh, path tra trajectory between uh, two nodes, and the uh, drones uh, go to the restaurant location, pick up the food, and uh, drop it off at the uh, home location. And uh, again, once uh, the order is delivered, one would be available uh, and uh, it stays at that location uh, until the uh, next order comes in. Uh, we have also two hybrid uh, systems. In hybrid systems, uh, both uh, robots and ground uh, are utilized. Uh, we have a, a network, we have a, a hub or uh, depot uh, in hybrid systems. <laughs> in hybrid system number one, uh, <clears throat> robots um, in uh, Hybrid system number one, in, uh, uh, in phase one, robots pick up the food from the depot. Uh, excuse me, uh, robots go to the, uh, from the depot, go to the restaurant location, uh, pick up the food and uh, go back to the uh, depot. And uh, then uh, uh, phase two comes in, uh, drone pick up the food from the uh, depot and uh, uh, drop it off at uh, the home location. 
the navigation process, again, for uh, robots uh, is based on a shortest path algorithm, and uh, for drones is based on uh, a stress path uh, trajectory. In uh, uh, hybrid system number two, it's the other way around. Uh, in phase one, uh, drones uh, go from the depot to the, uh, to the restaurant location, pick up the food, and then uh, go back to the uh, depot. And in phase two, uh, robots uh, pick up the food and, uh, and uh, they go to the uh, home location and drop it off. And again, uh, in this system, uh, uh, because uh, drones uh, are higher speed, uh, we should uh, we, uh, consider a uh, mean progression time, uh, which is added to each uh, request time. The navigation process, again, for, um, for ground is based on a straight path uh, trajectory between two nodes, and for robots, it's based on a uh, shortest path algorithm. Uh, the study area uh, is uh, downtown Mississauga. Uh, Mississauga is the sixth most populated uh, city in Canada, and uh, downtown Mississauga includes both uh, commercial and residential areas, um, and it has a high population density. Uh, the study period, uh, uh, the study period of the simulation uh, is a unique period uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. And uh, the demand used in this study is the time dependent exogenous demand, the uh, origin destination metric. Uh, we consider average uh, wait time as the performance measure, uh, and based on that, we define uh, different level of service. Uh, level of service A, B, C represent uh, the over reliable. Um, reliable and uh, stable system, uh, while uh, a lot of service DNF uh, represents uh, an uh, unreliable uh, system. In our uh, results, the uh, in our results, we, uh, we uh, actually uh, we tested different split sites uh, with uh, three different uh, demand scenarios: uh, original demand, 10% increase in demand, and 20% increase in demand. Um, the optimal fleet size for robot system, the optimal fleet size is uh, 75 robots, and the average uh, wait time using optimal fleet size as, as uh, maximum demand is, uh, is about uh, 32 minutes. Uh, for ground system, uh, the optimal uh, fleet size is 10 rounds, and average wait time using uh, optimal uh, fleet size at maximum demand is, uh, is about uh, 29 minutes. Uh, for hybrid systems, uh, we, uh, we considered uh, uh, the combination of uh, different combination of uh, fluid size for ground and uh, robots. In hybrid system number one, the optimal fluid size is the 25 robots and uh, 15 drones, um, and average wait time is about 17 minutes. And uh, there are also some uh, uh, scenarios with less uh, fluid size and acceptable uh, level of service, for example, level of service C. But um, as can be seen, uh, uh, um, about 38% uh, uh, of orders are in level of service B and F, which means that customers uh, have to wait in, in this, under these uh, scenarios, uh, customers have to wait for a long time. In hybrid system uh, number two, the optimal fleet size is uh, 20 drones and uh, 25 robots, and uh, the average wait time is about 25 minutes. Again, there are some scenarios with, uh, with less fluid size and acceptable uh, level of service, level of service B, but about 39% of uh, demands or orders um, are in uh, level of service B and F. Uh, 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 yeah, this shows that uh, just looking at the level of service is not enough, and we need to, um, and um, it's not enough to, to measure the performance of the system. Uh, in this study, we developed uh, four innovative uh, last mile food delivery systems, robot systems, robot drone systems, and two hybrid, hybrid systems. Uh, we consider average wait time and optimal fluid size as the performance measures. Uh, hybrid system number one was found the uh, most effective systems. Um, uh, for uh, future directions, uh, we can uh, develop an optimization based matching algorithm instead of uh, first and first out. Uh, wait or uh, can carry uh, multiple items, and we can consider a network with uh, multi hop, and also we can add autonomous vehicles for carrying uh, large items. Um, at the end, uh, I should say that this uh, study was published in IEEE Smart Cities, and it's available on the IEEE uh, Explore. Thank you. Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, and with that, we come to the Q and A uh, part of our session. I would like to ask all speakers to please turn on their videos. Okay, um, we have quite a few questions. 
Um, I'll start with Daniel. Uh, so uh, would hubs waiting areas need to be implemented or should the AGV be capable of tracking customers as they move through the shopping mall? And if you could also uh, sort of explain some of the regulations we have currently on using commercial drones. Uh, thanks for the question. So just to clarify, uh, these, these deliveries are going to uh, stores within the malls. So the routes that the vehicle can take are well established. And um, if there are any interferences or uh, maybe like work zones in the mall where something's being maintained, the idea is that the vehicle could be able to deviate around that. So it has autonomous capabilities. Uh, and for the regulatory question about drones, I can't speak to drones specifically, mostly because my research was focused on vehicles on the ground. But I know that um, one complication with drones is that they tend to have an additional layer of regulation from, at least in Canada, from uh, the federal regulators. A lot of uh, on-road regulations in Canada are delegated to uh, provincial ministries of transportation and then municipalities, but the vehicles in the air have the additional complexity of regulations uh, from the uh, federal agencies. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, for Tamir, um, question is, when considering LCVs, are you speaking about the 40 meter long LCVs that operate on freeways, not along the two lane highway, almost exclusively or regulated? Uh, or are you talking about the double trailers uh, at 27.5 meters? Also, um, have you considered human factors and the relation to passing distance? For instance, experts have indicated uh, to the, in the past that up to 30 meters vehicle length, a typical human can make a passing maneuver, but at longer lengths along two lane roadways, they have a difficulty determining the pass, uh, passability and thus will not pass or not safety anyway. And safety Thank you so much, Blair. Um, it's a nice question. Uh, for the uh, first question that uh, for this case, uh, long, long combination vehicle tag, the maximum length according to the tag manual, that one is 25 meter. So I have considered that for as long combination vehicle, that 25 meter length and, and long combination vehicle turn peak double, according to the ASHTO, that the maximum length is 34.75 meter. I have considered that as the long combination for the, those two long combination vehicles. And for the human factor, yeah, I have considered like uh, early pass and late pass, that type of con uh, conditions. Mm, yeah, I found out that lots of cases, uh, ve passenger vehicle are not feeling comfortable to pass the long combination vehicle or the truck platooning because the, uh, if they don't find the enough space um, for due to the oncoming um, vehicle on the opposite direction, if they don't find the enough space, they cannot overtake. They just ab abrupt their passing maneuver in this case. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is for Alia. Uh, so when doing your truck simulation, how would you go about simulating the feeling of real danger? situations like when in reality you're safe and your actions do not affect another's life how, how do you actually simulate that um so so the the truck simulator that we are purchasing and um uh, installing and in, at u of t will will provide uh, all the the feelings that that can be simulated like the 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 chair itself will will be a truck chair that that um um, has the feeling of the vibrations and all the, the if the truck is accelerating or whether it's um, decelerating and everything and e even the, the the turning the wheel of the of the truck itself will have such features. So uh, I think that everything can be can be simulated as far as I know. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and the one question for Mehdi is. It appears that the delivery machines via drone or robots can take care of small parcels only. If that is the case, delivery companies may need to generate multiple travels to deliver small and large products separately. Why is it a benefit then? Uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, for now, uh, as far as I know, uh, these robots and uh, the ro uh, ro these uh, new technologies, robots and uh, drones, are able to just uh, carry uh, small items, but um, they can uh, they can uh, actually carry multiple I I items at a time. Uh, for larger items, um, uh, as Mm, as far as I know, the, for, for example, Drone Trip Delivery Canada recently uh, uh, developed so, some uh, uh, new drones for uh, carrying larger items. Uh, uh, I think uh, 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 if, uh, for carrying larger items in the future, uh, the, the companies will uh, develop uh, the drones or robots uh, which are able to carry larger items. But in general, for uh, uh, for uh, super larger items, I think uh, we we should add uh, we can add, for example, autonomous vehicles or vehicles to uh, these systems for carrying um, larger items, as I mentioned uh, in in the future direction. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nathy, for that answer. There are other questions as well, but because of the time, I would encourage uh, the audience to reach out separately to each of the speakers. Uh, we're at the end of the session now. Uh, we're going to have a 10 minute break and come back at uh, 10 after 11 for our final session on supply chain and logistics. Um, Peter, anything you want to add or? Oh yeah. So the speakers, uh, you may see that there are multiple questions asked. So if there is a question that you haven't answered, then, then feel free to type your answers into the chat box. Uh, and for the uh, all the attendees, uh, we are going to meet again at eleven ten. Okay, so uh, have a just short health break. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So we are going to start again for the session number three. So Dr. Elkapi Hassini is going to be the moderator for the session number three. And he is the, uh, a professor and chair of operations management at the Degroot School of Business at McMaster University. He is also vice chair of the Smart Freight Center and research director for supply chain analytics at uh, the MISCAN Laboratory. And then currently uh, working as an associate faculty member for the School of Computational Science and Engineering. So welcome Dr. El Kapi for his moderating to session number three. Thank you, Peter, and uh, welcome everybody. It's great to see uh, many names that I know and uh, some that I don't. So uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to see you all sometime soon in person. And I very quickly, I would like to thank uh, it's not a, a, a thanking session, but uh, thank Peter and all the team that worked with him and uh, apologize for the delay that I may have caused to some of their planning because it's been a very busy term for me. But uh, thank you very much for putting this together. And it's great to see all uh, the work that's being done, uh, a lot of it with, within the Smart Freight Center. And I know there are many other students that are working and attending today. So it's uh, always good to see this um, project moving forward and being a center for transportation activity within uh, Ontario and um, Canada as well. So with that, I will start with our first uh, presenter, uh, Kianosh Mosawi, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto in transportation planning. And his research focuses on uh, crowd shipping business models for improving last mile delivery. And that would be the subject of his uh, presentation. So Kianush, please go ahead. Uh, you are muted. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the talk. Uh, and thank you so much for the introduction. I'm here today for presenting a last mile delivery with crowd shipping and mobile depot. This work is supervised by Mervo Patur and Matthew Rohr. So as an introduction, uh, 
for the about trends in e-commerce, you know that e-commerce revenue is expected to increase from about 48 percent from 2018 to 2023. And uh, an another survey for logistic provider and retailers showed that 87 percent of respondents would make a use of cloud shipping delivery by 2028, compared to responses about a 30 percent in 2019. And we know that based on uh, another data from IBM that the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated retail and e-commerce trend by around five years. And this ever-increasing demand for e-commerce directly resulted in an increase in last mile delivery. And I think crowd shipping can play a role and uh, take a share of this ever-increasing demand for uh, last mile delivery. Uh, so first of all, what is crowd shipping? So in short, crowdshipping is sharing and using existing individual spare time and vehicle capacity for delivering goods. So our companies are involved, already involved in this operation, such as Amazon Flex and Shipper B, which is a Canadian company. So uh, here, if you, if you look at the traditional delivery model, uh, you see that there is a main depot. There are three trucks which uh, start from a depot, go to the customer and deliver the packages and go back to depot. But when the crowd shipping is introduced to this traditional delivery model, uh, you see that one of uh, one of the crowd shipper replaces the one of the regular driver. This crowd shipper have an origin and destination. Uh, it starts from its origin, go to the depot, pick up packages, uh, uh, deliver it to the customer, and go back to its destination. Uh, but we know that the most of these depot and warehouse houses are outside of urban areas. And uh, we know that the majority of the potential crowd shipper are in living in urban areas. And so we don't have access to them if they are in the suburban areas or industrial area. And we know that if you have a, uh, access to more crowd shipper, the, and the, this operation would be more cost efficient because you have more option to match your customer to the crowd shipper. Uh, but so the approach can be you 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 can um, establish a, a micro hub or fix uh, fix uh, facilities in urban areas to kind of uh, use a crowd tripping operation. But th this approach might not be desirable for many companies because uh, it requires a huge investment, and uh, some companies don't want to take a risk. If, uh, some companies don't have that. And amount of capital to make this uh, investment. So we just thought that the using a mobile depot uh, can be an option uh, in a crowd shipping operation. Uh, so if so, this picture shows a crowd shipping operation with mobile depot. So you see that there is a main depot, which is implies outside of the region, and there are customers. Uh, which is uh, in a blue circle, and there are uh, mobile depot serving location candidate uh, that you can uh, see in a purple triangle. Uh, so in this operation, we see that we, uh, we, we load this uh, mobile depot, which are essentially truck to the customer packages. We send them to this uh, Canon mobile depot serving location. There is a mobile depot spend a few hours uh, in, in stop and the crowd should go and pick up the customer packages and deliver it on their way to the destination to the customers. Right. Uh, so in this problem, we aim to select the mobile depot stopping locations, assigning a customer to mobile depot and assigning a customer to crowd shipper and also uh, make a decision serving or rejecting uh, some of the customers uh, with the aim of minimizing a to total operational cost. So we model this problem as an integer program uh, and we consider a study area of uh, city of Toronto. Uh, you can see in this picture, and there's a main depot located in the region of Peel, which is a major uh, freight hub in North America. And the customer location are blue, and the, this uh, candidate mobile depot location are in green. So we generate this, uh, our instances, which you saw that in the previous picture, based on TTS data. So customer location are randomly generated in proportion to the population of each traffic zone, and crowd shippers are randomly generated based on the demand for each or origin destination purse that comes from TTS. We also select, selected the Canada Mobile Depot serving location, uh, but considering its uh, proximity into the neighborhood centers and availability of large outdoor parking lots. So. Um, in our deterministic model, we compare, uh, we compare it to the capacity of vehicle routing problem, which is a traditional uh, delivery model. Uh, most companies uh, use it, uh, and they have a very huge market share of last mile delivery. So we noticed that 
In the both instances, there are cases that our model result in a cost saving. And we notice that uh, when the mobile depot have a higher capacity than the trucks that are using vehicle routing problem, uh, this, um, this cost saving gets uh, much more significant. Uh, but another important aspect about crowdshipping is that crowdshipper, uh, the availability of a crowdshipper are usually highly uncertain. They don't have any commitment to participate in this delivery. You might have some idea that these crowdshippers are uh, might exist, and they and you have their um, like their itinerary itinerary pattern, but and there's no commitment from their side. And at the same time, you don't have a exact avail exact data about their availability. But you might have some data based on their uh, historical data or based on a research survey about their probability distribution in terms of their availability. So we want to make the, we wanted to incorporate this uh, availability of crowdshipper as an uncertain parameter uh, in our existing model to make a best decision about where and where to, uh, to send this mobile deep. So we extended the current inter-programming model to the two-stage uh, stochastic integer programming model. In the first stage, uh, we make a decision about where and when to set up this mobile depot and which packages of customer we load in the mobile depot and which customer we want to serve or reject. And after uh, revealing the data of the crowdshipper availability, uh, we make a second stage decision, which is assigning a crowdshipper to the customer. And in this problem, we aim uh, to make a best first stage decision and, and by minimizing the first stage cost plus the expected second stage operational cost. So uh, for this two stages stochastic, integer stochastic problem, uh, if you want to use a, if, the, if you want to implement a ex extensive format of the model and use the like a commercial optimizer such as CPLEX, it was, com uh, it was computationally prohibitive because it takes us so much time and, and because we need to solve this problem on a daily basis it was impractically impossible to use extent, extensive format of the problem. So uh, we developed, a, we needed to develop an algorithm to solve this problem faster and come up with a solution. So we, we developed a vendor decomposition algorithm that uh, this decomposition algorithm enabled us to solve uh, the stochastic model for medium and large instances in a reasonable time. Um, and uh, we also showed that uh, when we implement a decision based on a stochastic model, on average, we have a 6% cost saving compared to the deterministic model for our largest instance. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we introduced a new crowdshipping model and we showed that in the deterministic version, uh, our model has some um, advantages compared to the capacity of the VRP. And, uh, and we also know that this model favor, favor urban areas because we have an access to the uh, potential crowd shipper. At the same time, we know that this model doesn't need a huge capital investment because you only need a mobile depot and uh, like a parking permit. Uh, and also, you know that this model is a very flexible. So on a daily basis, based on the crowd shippers pattern and based on the customer demand pattern, you can change the mobile depot location, stopping location. So, and we also uh, showed that uh, uh, incorporated the stochasticity in terms of avail availability of a crowd shipper in our model. We develop a uh, um, vendor decomposition algorithm and we also showed the value of a stochastic solution. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for attending my talk. And uh, this was just an introduction about the work. And uh, so the paper is available online in the uh, here, if you need, uh, if you want to see the detail of the model or some other extens extensions such as risk adverse model that we incorporated in the existing model. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Kianush. I will leave questions like other sessions for uh, the end. We're uh, running a little late uh, based on the schedule. So uh, we'll move to our next uh, speaker, Ranwa El Malah. Uh, who has obtained a PhD in computer science from Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal. And she's now doing a postdoctoral uh, job at Ryerson University. And her work is on cyber physical systems in the context of smart cities. So Ranwa, please uh, go ahead.
Oh, yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, I will present to you a blockchain framework for urban mobility that was developed and implemented by members of our lab. So, um, first of all, I would like to um, talk about the location data industry and the challenges we are facing in this context. Uh, ordinary people's personal mobility data, uh, particularly the location uh, or mobility data has the potential to help governments and researchers to better understand hu human mobility for designing smarter and demand-driven transportation systems. And traditionally, mobility data were solicited via small-scale surveys and governments would take the responsibility to secure this information because it is personal. So nowadays, because of the advances in information and communication technology, we have smartphones, cell phone towers, Wi-Fi hotspot, traffic sensors that can passively solicit detailed mobility data of the urban population. In this context, we talk about smart mobility data and the percentage of users with smartphones and uh, or having access to computer grows every day. So the ubiquitous nadir and uh, high spatial temporal resolution of the smart mobility data that can be extracted becomes very attractive to transportation studies as it will result in more robust transportation systems and designs. So what's interesting is that um, by passively soliciting this detailed mobility data of people of the urban population, we are able to collect the information that we need but with minimal input from the user or the data generator. And this collection process is usually done in a centralized manner by different industries and companies. They, they store or mobile or location data in central servers and they manage and control it. So um, you used to require a warrant to access location data of people, but nowadays the problem is that we, the users, are, are not aware who uh, our location data ends up with because our transportation data is shared across multiple entities. And even if we examine um, the, 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 po the privacy policies of the possible holders of our mobility data, we may not ultimately realize how many different industries or companies or government agencies are buying our most sensitive data. So these are the challenges, the considerations. Um, the, the, there's a question of what can be done with the data versus what is to be done and other con, uh, considerations in terms of what is the shell life of the data. Um, so um, we put forward that the blockchain technology it has the potential to render the, the transaction of mobility data more secure and transparent. So we propose a blockchain for smart mobility. Um, this, the idea is that your own mobility data and, and you own your, your mobility data and via the functionalities of the blockchain technology, you can manage who can use it. You can share it with the other participant of the blockchain network as long as both parties agrees to the transaction rules issued by you, the owner of the data. So the core concept is that data becomes a tradable commodity. The principles of the blockchain, the proposed blockchain for smart mobility data market are ownership, transparency, and access control. So um, this is the blockchain network we use. We see in blue the nodes participating in the network. Uh, we also can see in orange how the nodes collect their own data and store it in identifications. And um, once a transaction is complete, some nodes of the blockchain would write the transaction inside a block and append it to the ledger or, or blockchain seen in red here in the figure. So this blockchain is qualified as public closed and it means that anyone can do the transaction and have access to the ledger, but only a restricted set of nodes are involved in adding the blocks um, and growing the chain after reaching consensus between each other. So usually blockchain frameworks are often described in layers. So here are the different layers that will address the privacy, uh, security, management, and scalability challenges. In the first layer, the identification layer is composed of the mobility and other information that the node owns. And then the privacy layer is where we find the differential privacy model for accessing location-based services. In the contract layer are the set of smart contracts and the brokers who facilitate a transaction between the nodes. The communication layer contains the decentralized identifiers of the nodes who serve as endpoint to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection. And the consensus layer contains the consensus algorithm because before adding a block to the blockchain, the nodes in the network need to reach a consensus. 
And finally, uh, an incentive layer or in the incentive layer are the economic rewards that the active nodes receive for participating in the con con consensus and the rewards node will receive for sharing their information. We show here an example of a transaction done over the blockchain. In step one, the university contacts the broker to get participants. In step two, the broker sends a transaction request to, the, to its client. And in step, in step three, an, an encrypted peer-to-peer -peer channel of communication is opened between the entities. So in step four, the, we can see that the, the nodes will submit a transaction request to the BSMD, the blockchain, and an active node uh, will build a block with the characteristic of the transaction. In step five, they use a consensus protocol and the active node will write the block to the ledger. Um, among the use cases, um, we conducted a case study where um, a, a mode choice model is distributed and estimated over the blockchain. So it's a generalized distributed tool for mobility choice modeling where participants do not share the personal raw data while computations are done locally. Um, since the transport, also since the transport sector accounts for one of the, mo the highest shares of greenhouse gas emission, we propose a way to control the transportation sector caused GHG emissions through an emission trading system that leveraged this blockchain. Uh, and it's the uh, blockchain based user centric emission monitoring and trading system for multimodal uh, mobility. Also, we propose a cybersecurity risk assessment framework for blockchain and use the blockchain as a use case to identify risky threats affecting the blockchain ecosystem. Um, to conclude, the BSMD is designed to solve privacy, security, and management issues related to sharing large-scale data. And um, in BSMD, all the information is stored at user devices, and they expli explicitly select with whom they want to share the information. So smart contracts, they allow individuals with information, which information they want to share. And um, finally, uh, one possible future application of the BSMD is for smart card and travel survey data management and analytics as it enables easy access and usage control. Another avenue is the use of the framework for mobility as a service for fixed as well price uh, formation markets. And finally, we may use the blockchain for communication and data transfer of connected and autonomous vehicles. So these are our references and um, feel thanks very much for your attention. Check out our implementation at this link. Thank you very much, Ranwa. I did not mean to rush you, but thank you for <laughs> making it on time and being very uh, concise. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, if you have questions to the speakers, please put them on uh, the chat and I'm uh, following up there to uh, take one question per speaker later. And we'll move on to our next speaker, Yanling Zhuang, from, uh, who's uh, currently uh, a visiting international PhD student at the Degroot School of Business. Uh, uh, and she works on e-commerce and logistics management uh, issues. So Yanling, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Hasimi. Um, our research topic is about the order picking optimization of mobile robots warehouse fulfillment systems. This work is cooperated with Professor Yunzhou, Professor Yu Fei Yuan, Professor Xiang Pei Hu, and Professor El Kafi Hassini. This is the agenda of this presentation. The first part is about the introduction. Due to the long working distance and heavy workload of the traditional manual order picking systems, in recent years, many online retailers try to use robotic mobile fulfillment systems to pick customers' orders. Uh, this video shows uh, the order picking process of this kind of system. And the robots carry racks from the storage area to the picking stations where pickers pick items from racks and put items to the totes corresponding to some customer orders. Then the robot leaves the finished rack back to the storage area or other workstations and the picker can pick items from the next rack. During this kind of order picking process, several decisions should be made. First, we need to decide that each order is assigned to which workstation. Second, due to the capacity limit of the total area, the picker can only pick 
several orders at a time. Therefore, we need to decide the order picking sequence at each workstation. Third, uh, the racks brought to the uh, brought to one picking station should match the order processing sequence at that workstation. Therefore, we need to decide the rack presentation sequences as well. The next part is about the literature review. Uh, researches about the robotic mobile fulfillment system can be divided into four categories. Our research is about the order picking optimization. Several papers about the order picking problem have been published since 2017 uh, from different perspectives. However, most of them um, focus on the order picking problem at a single workstation. The order and rack sequencing at multiple workstations using optimization models has not been studied yet. Next part is about the mathematical model. Uh, I want to introduce several assumptions before modeling. In a warehouse, there are several workstations picking orders simultaneously. At each workstation, there is a toad area. We assume that each toad corresponds to one order and there is a capacity limit of the total area that restricts the number of orders that are processed simultaneously. A new order can be assigned to the workstation immediately to replace the finished one. One of the characteristics of this kind of system is that the same SQ can be stored at multiple racks. Under these assumptions, we can formulate a mixed integer programming model, which can be used to find the best solution in small scale cases. The key decision variables are X and Y. We use X, I, K, T to represent order I is uh, processed by workstation K in time slot T and uh, Y, J, when J, K, T equals one, it means that reg J is visiting workstation K in time slot T. Our objective is to minimize the total number of rec movements since it is the bottleneck of this kind of system. Uh, we use epsilon kt to track the changes in racks to calculate the total number of rack movements. Since the limited time, I will not introduce all constraints. This is the model we constructed. I want to introduce our solution approach in detail. First, we define the fulfillment rate between order i and rack j to represent the percentage of order i that can be fulfilled by rack j. The denominator represents the total number of SQs in order I. Uh, the numerator represents the number of SQs in order I that can be fulfilled by RecJ. Uh, in this example, there are three SQs in order I and two of them can be fulfilled by RecJ. Therefore, the fulfillment rate equals two thirds. Second, we define the supply rate of RECs since a rack visiting a workstation can potentially fulfill several orders fully or partially, we use supply rate to indicate the extent to which a rack can satisfy a set of orders. In this example, the supply rate of rack J is uh, three over two. We also define the candidate orders of racks and the candidate racks of orders. Using met this matrix, we uh, explain our algorithm through a little example. Here we have seven orders in the order pool waiting to be processed and six, uh, uh, there are six racks in the warehouse. In the first step, we calculate the supply rate of all racks according to uh, the information of all orders in the order pool and choose the most used rack to the workstation, which is rack number four. In the second step, we calculate the fulfillment rate of all orders based on the information of rec four and find the candidate orders of this rec. Then we choose those orders with the highest fulfillment rate to the workstation. When uh, the total areas of all workstations are full, we can start the order picking process. If some orders are finished, they can be removed from the total area and we can assign new orders to the workstation immediately. Uh, after each rack is assigned to the workstation, we can find the candidate orders of this rack. Uh, at the same time, according to those orders at the workstation, we can find the candidate racks of these orders. If the candidate orders set is empty, 
we can assign new orders to the workstation based on the information of this candidate ranks. However, in this example, we have one order in the candidate order set. Therefore, we can assign this order for to the workstation directly. And we can continue this kind of assignment based on the supply rate, firm rate candidate orders and candidate regs. This is the complete order picking process of this example. We call our algorithm the interactive reg order sequencing algorithm for multiple workstations, IROSM. Um, this algorithm can find the best solution for this example. Next part is about the numerical results. In a real world robotic mobile fulfillment system, there are 1,194 racks, which store a total of 25,960 SQs. We choose those orders from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., which is called one wave. The average number of uh, orders of seven days is 892. First, in the small scale cases, we generate several data sets based on the real world distributions. We also use CPLEX to solve the mathematical model directly and hand over the solution found by our algorithm to CPLEX as a warm start. Uh, the results show that mm, the solution found by CPLEX within 30 minutes is worse than that of uh, our algorithm. Uh, the results also imply that there is no significant improvement in using MIP start. In the real world case, we compare our algorithm with some other rules proposed by the existing literature. Um, the average computational time of our algorithm for this large scale real world case is about 74 seconds. And from this figure, we can find that our algorithm can on average reduce rack movements by uh, up to 62% compared with the real world operation. Finally, conclusions. In this research, we formulate a mixed integer programming model. Second, we introduce a polynomial time data driven heuristic. Third, our solution approach can reduce rack movements by up to 62% compared with the current practice. That's all for this presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Alink. Thank you also for uh, trying to uh, be on time. That's good. Uh, we'll move to our last presentation by Sayed Obaid Ali. Uh, he's a civil engineering master's student at York University and works on freight route planning. Um, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Th thank you for having me at the Smart Freight Center Symposium. Today, I will talk about modeling long haul truck route choice in Ontario. This has been my master's thesis topic. And through this presentation, I will do my best to summarize some of the work that we have done to achieve this. And so I will start by outlining the goals and objectives of this study and explain how we conducted the modeling uh, for this exercise. I will then talk about the kind of data we worked with and how we use statistical models to create inferences from this data. We will then see how well this model performed and we will apply it to some hypothetical scenarios to demonstrate its practicality. So the need for this kind of study comes from the visible and substantial growth observed along Ontario's highways in truck traffic. And this will continue to grow as uh, population increases, international trade increases, and e-commerce continues to grow as we saw in our previous presentations. So as transportation planners, we need to understand what are the current routes that truck drivers are using today and why they're using them so that we can predict what traffic patterns they will be tomorrow. And that will help us inform our transportation infrastructure planning. So 
So to model or to create this kind of model, the first thing we need is large amounts of data, map match data, so that we can digitize the trajectory of a truck throughout a road network. The next thing we need is a way to define or differentiate one route from another so that we understand which two routes are unique and can we analyze separately or are we analyzing the same route twice? And we do this using something called the commonality factor, which measures the overlap of two routes with each other. And we're doing this essentially to prevent the analysis of a route several times. Once we have defined our routes and our choice of routes, we will then see the utility of each route and predict which route a certain driver will pick based on that utility. So a little bit of, a bit about utility. If you're a truck driver, a rational truck driver, you will choose the route that gives you the most happiness. I am trying to change the screen. I'll go to the next slide. Okay, great. So if you're a rational truck driver, you will choose the route that gives you the most uh, happiness or utility, and you will determine that whether based on what's important to you. Is it travel time that matters? Is it the number of rest areas or is it the usage of freeways? And these essentially become your factors that we can plug into a utility model such as a logistic model. And that utility will then subsequently give us the probability of you selecting one route over other routes in your choice set. So this is the kind of type of model that we uh, used in this study. Now to conduct my analysis, I was given a very large data set of about 50,000 truck trips that occurred between more than 800 cities and towns in Ontario. I also had the road network of Ontario available to me to uh, create some descriptive characteristics about each route. Now, just as an example, I have Peel region in front of me. And over here, immediately you can see there might be about 20 different uh, route options that a driver can take to travel between these areas. But a lot of them overlap with each other. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to be analyzing the same route twice. So we created an algorithm in ArcGIS that would compare systematically each route and group them based on their overlap. So two routes that are very similar would be grouped into a single route. And just to show you the algorithm or this flow chart was applied to the entire data set, all 50,000 trips we had. And based on a threshold value of 85%, we determined that if two routes are more than 85% similar, you don't have to analyze both of them. You can eliminate one and, and keep the other. And as an example, I'm using the same uh, origin and destination pair. We can see that trip number 113 used route number three. And that is uh, fairly visible because these two uh, paths overlap with each other quite a lot. So using this algorithm applied to the entire data set, we managed to group these 50,000 truck trips into about 2,400 uh, unique routes. And each route, we then analyzed their performance characteristics as well as their infrastructure characteristics. So performance, and first, uh, performance measures included things like speed or minimum travel time and maximum travel time, while the infrastructure variables concerned uh, usage of freeways, number of intersections a truck driver has to go through or the number of diesel stations along the way. After inputting all this information into a statistical software called Enlogit, we managed to perform a logistic regression and obtain the following significant variables on your screen. So these are the factors that we determined to be the most important to route, routing decisions. And these are the minimum travel time, the usage of freeways or proportion of freeways along a route, the proportion of Highway 401 along a route, the number of diesel stations, and the number of intersections. And going back to utility theory, when we take these factors and we plug it into the logit model that we see on the top right of the screen, we can calculate the probability of a route being selected uh, out of a given choice set. When I compared uh, how well this model predicts the usage of route 
to what we actually observed in our data set, we got almost a one-to-one -one relationship, which showed that the model is performing appropriately and is representing the data adequately. Now to put this uh, model to the test, we created this scenario that what if Highway 401 was so congested that truck drivers were forced to reroute uh, off their original routes. And as an example, we can see that the blue route, which is the existing most popular route is along Highway 401. But after congesting Highway 401, the most popular route became the green route, which goes along Highway 402. And we applied this scenario to the bulk of Ontario and we determined that there are some major uh, freight hubs that will uh, have the most rerouting impact if there was ever severe congestion on Highway 401. So to conclude, I had already mentioned the most important factors for truck drivers. And finally, uh, this research is useful for transportation planning authorities if they ever want to determine the route options between any two given cities. You can apply this algorithm to Alberta, to BC, any other province you want. Uh, we can also see how well connected certain origins and destinations are. And if you ever wanted to prioritize traffic safety or truck safety, these routes could be some of your candidate routes based on their popularity. And last this kind of model be used to predict future transportation patterns if we treat the data with appropriate growth statistics. I'm also proud to say that this work has been accepted for presentation at the Transportation Research Board, and I would be looking forward to presenting this again in January sometime. Thank you. I will take questions now. Thank you very much. And uh, so there are a couple of questions that have been sent, some uh, to everybody, one, some just to me on uh, the chat. And I will try to have a question per speaker so that we're on time. And I'll start with the first speaker, Kianush. So there were actually a couple of questions, but I will try to group them. So if you please get ready. Um, uh, the question was on um, the whether you have considered service time or not. Uh, so it, it refers to time and efficiency and also regulatory issues in terms of setting up mobile depots. Um, there was a question on vendors, which I suggest we leave as a side talk. I think, in fact, my area, I work on vendors decomposition, but I, I don't think you'll be able to answer questions on that in a short time. So if you could just focus on service time, whether you have included or what do you think about adding service time and also the regulatory issues when it comes to mobile depots. Uh, so, um, a very good question. So about service time, uh, we didn't consider service time, uh, but I think if we want to make comparison with a vehicle routing problem, it's very important that we consider that. I think it's kind of help us and I think it's way more to crowd shipping in terms of a result because it's more disaggregated approach of the uh, for last mile delivery. If our regula regulatory issues, no, uh, we didn't uh, consider that, but uh, that's very important in operational side. And, uh, and I think this is a concern of the companies that are implementing these business models mostly, and it's usually region specific. Thank you. And the the other part of that, uh, Janusz, was on uh, regulatory issues. So local regulations for setting up mobile depots, if that's something you have looked at or not. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, I think we have enough time to uh, move now to the next speaker, Ranwa. And one of the questions that uh, came up was also related to regulations that we know even ha reaching a standard for uh, block uh, chain technology, it's not clear whether we have a standard that the businesses can trust, privacy issues, and also whether we have the technology infrastructure to apply some of the frameworks that you're suggesting. So any, uh, what, what are your views on that? 
Yes, so in terms of the technology infrastructure, is it uh, the, the limitation with blockchain in, in any use case application, it's it, the scalability of the system and the current technology might not be able to scale very at large scale. It has limitation in that sense. We're hoping that um, as years go by technology, we, we, we will get better and we'll have more um, in innovations in that domain. Um, the first, regarding the first question, um, if, in terms of regulations also, before um, it was assumed that code was law. So uh, after many cybersecurity breaches, this changed. So um, it's an open, um, how, how, how the, the question is, how is it legally binding? Um, how is the, the transactions done over the blockchain are legally binding is, is still um, an, an open challenge to, to, to the application of the blockchain. Okay, thank you, Rama. And our next speaker, Jan Link, uh, one of the questions is on, um, you showed some efficiency on using mobile robots within the warehouse in terms of decreasing uh, the processing time and the order setting time. One of the questions is how significant in that in terms of um, in, uh, improving the service time for last mile delivery? Uh, actually, our uh, research is um, before the last mile delivery. Mm. Uh, the current operation of online retailers is they set a, a due time for the uh, for the last last mile delivery. For example, in China is um, 11, 8, 8, uh, 12, p 12 p.m. They need to pick all orders before uh, 12 p.m. If those orders are ordered uh, in the morning, uh, so. Our our objective is to minimize uh, the number of rack movements so that we can ensure those orders can be uh, processed before the due time. Okay. Thank you. And I'm just checking my notes here, uh, my the chat window. Okay. So we'll move on to uh, obey. Then we have our closing remark is getting close. Uh, we're getting close to the time for that. So Ubaid, there are a couple of uh, points that have been mentioned. One uh, technical note on adding a correction factor to avoid bias in your uh, model. And also another question on um, to explain the part where you have added a commonality factor in your utility function. What is the role of that? So maybe I'll stop here and give you a chance to address those. Thank you very much. These are both, both valid questions and they also answer each other. The <laughs> correction factor needed for this kind of uh, this kind of model is the commonality factor itself. And once you incorporate that commonality factor, it is henceforth referred to as a C logic model, not just a normal multinomial logic model. So for the second question, the role of the c logic model is to account for the biases uh, incurred due to the choice set generation. Thank you, Obeda. And we have, there were also questions about the, I think your presentation was interesting in, in highlighting some of those factors using your statistical model. One, uh, some uh, notes were raised on what other factors you may have missed and if you can comment on that. And that includes um, uh, driver's payment strategy. Uh, do you think that would affect their route? And also, if you have looked at the type of goods that are being shipped and intermodal facilities. So these are some, just all in terms of other factors that whether those uh, you included them or not, or whether you have found that they're important or not in your model. I think every factor is uh, important. The more factors you have, the more descriptive you can be with this kind of model. Unfortunately, some of the data is not presented to us in that manner. So for example, one factor that I feel was very important was reliability. But 
what happens is that if a root is used so many times, there ends up being a lot of variability in its travel time, and then you cannot capture reliability anymore. So the more a root is used, the more variance there is in travel time. So that was one factor I wish we could use, but we cannot. Uh, second, the types of goods that uh, are being shipped, how they affect routes. Uh, they, we did not have that kind of data, uh, but it would be very interesting for a type of route safety analysis if we were to do a hazmat uh, type analysis on route choice. So that would be pretty useful over there. As for the driver payment, I do not know how much truck drivers are being paid uh, in this country and how much their honesty impacts uh, their uh, service to uh, their employer as well. I don't think that was part of the scope of this kind of study. It was purely based on that data. Thank you, Obaid, for sharing your perspective. And I agree with you, um, uh, the, the issue, uh, the key difference there is whether data is available or not. So thank you all to uh, our speakers for uh, since the start of uh, today's part of the symposium, this is a follow-up of uh, uh, last Friday where we had the other um, uh, mostly business and uh, government speakers as well as an update from the universities. And I think for closing remarks, I would like to um, introduce uh, Gurpreet Dillon, who's a uh, regional counselor for Brampton Wards 9 and 10. And his... Um, the, the, the wards that he's representing have uh, more than 11,000 truck drivers. Uh, and so he's familiar with uh, the, uh, the, the issues that they, they deal with and the contributions more importantly that they have to goods movement in Brampton and uh, Peer region and the country overall. And also he's been uh, an active member of the Peel's Goods Movement Task Force, in particular focusing on uh, safety and efficiency of movements of goods and people within the Brampton uh, region. Uh, so uh, please uh, go ahead, Gorbrit, for your closing remarks. Thank you so much. Firstly, just want to get a mic test. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah, it's good. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, my name is Regional. My name is Gurpreet Singh Dillon. I'm a regional counselor from uh, Peel region. Uh, it was great to have attended my very first Smart Freight Symposium today. Uh, and it was truly an excellent event. And I'm very pleased to uh, see our young rising and future transportation professionals from University of Toronto, uh, McMaster University and York University delivering such great presentations today. Uh, and I wanna thank everyone uh, for attending the Smart Freight Symposium. Uh, we had some great representation at this symposium from various speakers. And this just shows the importance of good movement issues and how they're affecting uh, such a broad spectrum of our lives, especially now in the current pandemic situation across municipalities, municipalities the provinces, uh, and Canada as a whole. Smart Freight Center is a great partnership between universities, the region of Peel, and public and private sector partners. I'm particularly happy to mention that the Regional Council and myself are committed to improving goods movement in the region of Peel and Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Goods movement, knows no geographical, geographical boundary. Uh, everyone here has a stake uh, in safe and efficient movement of, people's, of people and goods. Uh, we know that we all have a responsibility to our residents uh, and businesses to provide a safe uh, and efficient transportation network within and beyond all of our borders. But we need a coordinated approach and a great collaboration and great collaborations to do so. So I wanna thank uh, Smart Freight Centers Universities, York McMaster and the University of Toronto uh, for organizing this symposium. I want to especially thank Dr. Uh, Peter Park, York University, uh, and his team uh, for taking the lead in organizing this symposium. I also want to thank Dr. Judy uh, Fabelden and Patricia Doherty at Uni from University of Toronto uh, for their tireless efforts uh, for taking care of the last minute details and facilitating uh, the symposium. I also wanna thank our Peel Regional staff for providing their support to this initiative. Uh, it's because of all of your efforts and participation in an event like this, that we're taking big steps in improving our goods movement and transportation network. As we move forward, cooperation and collaboration will be central to our success. I wanna thank all of you once again for attending uh, the Smart Freight Symposium. Thank you and have a great weekend, everybody.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dillon, for your wonderful uh, closing remark. And uh, I really appreciate that. So, uh, you know, this is the end of the 2020 Smart Face Symposium. Uh, just for your uh, record, uh, during the uh, last week, November 20 Symposium, we had uh, 16 different presenters. And today we had uh, 14 different presenters, including uh, speakers from University of Toronto, McMaster, uh, your university, as well as the Lyons University. I just want to uh, credit for your hard work uh, over the past, uh, I guess, uh, many days to prepare for today's wonderful presentation. Uh, and I also want to say uh, that uh, uh, Pat and Julie from the University of Toronto helped us uh, tremendously for, uh, for the success of these two days uh, symposium, as well as Sandy, Ariel, and William uh, at your university also helped uh, a lot, uh, obviously, for uh, this uh, preparing for this symposium. Uh, the last comment that I want to do uh, is that, as I mentioned on uh, last week of Fridays, uh, you know, uh, during my presentation, uh, perhaps uh, uh, for this uh, time, uh, the most important thing is uh, disseminating the, uh, the vaccination to uh, the needed persons and those logistical challenges, not small. Uh, that's what I'm hearing from the media. So for that, our role is uh, tremendous. Uh, and then uh, the final remark will be that for the 2021 Smart Face Symposium, I wish that all of us can again to meet each other, wherever it can be, it can be McMaster University or Lyons University or UOT or even at uh, your university again. But next year at this time of the day, I wish we can meet each other and shake our hands and then perhaps uh, uh, enjoy the, uh, the end of the pandemic for us. Okay, and have a wonderful day and I really appreciate your uh, participation. Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you, Peter. And uh, see you all uh, next year in uh, the symposium. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.